Okay, the regular meeting of the Kirkwood uh, Meadows Public Utility Districts called to order, and I'd like to ask Peter to do the roll call, please. Certainly, Epstein. Present. Schroeder. John, are you there? Present. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> uh, Perot? Present. Mitteranda? Yep. Thornbrook here. Okay, thank you. Um, Eric, any announcements? Just the usual announcement. Welcome everybody to the meeting and please use the raise your hand function if you would like to speak. Okay, thanks. So let me see if anyone has any corrections to the agenda or changes uh, on the consent calendar. Okay, I'm not hearing any, so we'll assume we'll do them in the order as defined. Uh, let me now move to comments from the audience, an opportunity for members of the public to address the board on any non-agenda item within our jurisdiction. And also let me um, see whether any of the county supervisors are available, are available to give us an update as well. So well, uh, yeah. Eric, do you wanna? Yeah, Jeff Brown asked to, to talk, uh, I saw him this weekend, so he's- uh, Okay, great, Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Um, one of the things that the county had just uh, finished up this last Tuesday with the uh, ordinance for defensible space. And so that's uh, gonna be coming into work. So um, code enforcement with the uh, assistance of AFPD can help out and look at properties that CAL FIRE cannot get to. And that's about it I have. Yeah, I have a question for Jeff. Yes, sir. Uh, I got a notice from uh, Volcano Telephone that uh, Amador County residents can uh, uh, ask to have chipping service performed on a first come first ser serve basis. Are, are you aware of that? Amador Resource Conservation District is the one right. that, that right. does that. And you can go look up onto their website and, uh, and put a request in. Would they be willing to come out to Kirkwood? <laughs> I wouldn't see why not. Okay. It'd be nice to get a whole bunch of people together, you know, have material sitting there. Right, right. Well, it's a little early for that, but uh, the snow's melting today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one thing I would say is that um, they've had a couple uh, chipping events down here in in the Buckhorn Pioneer area where uh, they people could bring the material to the chipper. So you had one central place to chip. And, oh, okay. And then the other uh, event that they had was where they would you know, run around to different um, neighborhoods and it, but they blow the material back on the property. Right. Okay, well, because I've had uh, several homeowners have asked me about that. Okay. All right, uh, thank you, Peter and Jeff. Um, Terry Woodrow? Can you hear me? Am I on we there? Can. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I can lower my hand now too. Um, so I just saw that you wanted to uh, speak to the supervisors. I don't have anything um, really to report other than to remind you to uh, get out and vote uh, for the statewide uh, primary election on June 7th. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, and I see that Reed Bennett. Go ahead, Reed. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, I'm calling uh, in on participating on a few things. And just, you know, I've been a homeowner uh, since the 80s and I'm concerned because in the past, the PUD has really been kind of like, I thought of them as like the, the city council. And it was one place in the community that would, if anything, kind of bring people together. And I have been hearing from lots of different data points that the actions of the PUD have been doing quite the opposite and both newer residents and older residents, and you're doing things that are really disturbing and they're disturbing to other people. Um, 
And frankly, some of it is disturbing enough that people don't want to be there anymore. And you're not doing things to help property values, quite the opposite. I have sent emails to the PUD over the last few weeks asking specific questions, have not got been response. There's no, been, been no responses to it, and even pretty simple questions. Um, I'm concerned about the longtime resident uh, on Dangberg, Lower Dangberg, and there's a problem on the PUD side of the meter, and yet the PUD, my understanding, has been expecting the homeowner to pay to rectify it. And also the thing with uh, Bob Weber. And okay, so if you wanna turn off the gas uh, for Bob Weber because you think it's not safe, which is questionable, but now that there's less snow, I don't think that there's a safety issue there. And to turn off water where there's not a safety issue with the water, and especially now that you're getting well into spring, I mean, you guys could find yourself with a pretty big uh, case of litigation there. And to turn off water when there's not a problem with the delivery of the water is something that I, I haven't heard one person who supports that. There's not one person I know of that thinks the PUD is doing the right thing. And I'm talking about a variety of of resident. So okay, Reed, you, you need to wrap it up, please. Okay. Well, I think it's time for the PUD to be uh, more friendly to the community and for the staff out in the field to be more decent to homeowners. And um, to wrap it up, also, I will say I support Howard Hoffman's uh, comment letter, and I think those things need to be taken into account. But you are doing okay. things to fracture the community, and it is okay. not good. My suggestion would be, since we are currently doing a customer survey, so that you add specifics to that and encourage other people to as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, written comments from the public. Uh, there, there are three. Uh, is that correct, Eric? Uh, there, there were three, and then there was one that came in late, which um, uh, from Peter Catalano saying he supported the other three okay. written comments. So I think it'd be appropriate to comment on those in 9H since they're all related to that. Okay, uh, then um, when we move on to item seven, adoption of the consent calendar, is there a motion to approve it? Yeah, Dornbrook so moved. Okay. A second. Second. Okay, thank you, Doug. All right, then uh, Peter, please do a roll call. Sure. Epstein? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Minuturanda? Aye. Perot? Aye. Thornburg, aye. It's unanimous. Okay, thanks. So we're ready to move on to item nine. Uh, Kelly, update on the finances. Sure. Uh, so I didn't really have any notes on the balance sheet, um, unless there are any questions on the balance sheet. Okay, moving on to the uh, revenue account by fund. Um, you'll notice that all of our funds are in the positive uh, besides uh, employee housing. Um, that is to be expected in employee housing. Um, so, uh, Good to see all of our funds in the positive. Moving on to uh, the combined income statement on <clears throat> uh, for the month of uh, March, operating revenues were up from plan by $39,000. Year to date, uh, revenues are down from plan by uh, $9,000. Uh, total operating. Um, I did have a note regarding um, the fact that the $450,000 um, property tax allocation uh, 
to cover tier ratios for calendar year 2021, um, the way we have to move that revenue through uh, from uh, operating revenues to a non-operating revenue does skew uh, the operating <clears throat> expenses uh, budget. Uh, so you can see that um, if you consider that $450,000 uh, total operating for uh, uh, through the month of uh, March is actually um, just down from plan by about $65,000. Um, and you can see uh, total um, net income is actually up from plan by $41,000. So just a note about that, uh, that skew there from the uh, allocation of property tax revenues. Moving on to water. Um, I believe it's page 16 of your packet. Uh, operating revenues uh, year to date for water are down from plan by $34,000. Uh, total operating though for water is actually up from plan by $19,000 and um, water actually being uh, in the black is a good thing and is proof that uh, our new rate structure is doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, moving on to wastewater on uh, page 17. Um, I had a note regarding the large variance in operations and maintenance, um, and that you can see uh, is actually, it nets out with the, um, the savings that we're having in uh, salaries and wages and payroll taxes uh, due to the, um, the one operator that we had working through, uh, through water talent. Um, year to date total operating for electric is down from plan by 51,000 or almost $52,000. Moving on to electric on page 19, uh, operating revenues for the month of March were up from plan by $55,000. Uh, year to date uh, operating revenues are up from plan by $15,000. Uh, total operating for electric is down from plan by $108,000. Moving on to propane on page 22, operating revenues uh, year to date are up from plan by $8,000. Uh, total operating for propane is down from plan by $65,000. And that is mainly due to uh, the cost of propane uh, being so uh, much higher than uh, what we have experienced in the past. And uh, that's really all I have on income statements, unless there are any questions. Okay, moving on to April preliminaries. Um, operating revenues for the month of April were up from plan by $45,000. And you can see um, that is mainly due to commercial revenues um, and the resort being open all the way through April, which was great. Um, so year to date uh, operating revenues are up from plan by about uh, $36,000. Any questions on April preliminaries? So, so we are 469 or 470, let's say, a thousand below budget for the year. Uh, is there something that need to, is going to be catch up later? Uh, can you we're not explain? below budget. We're over. We're, we we have more revenues than what we budgeted. I'm not talking about revenue. I'm talking about total operating. Oh, okay, so that's the opposite. Uh, it's total operating at the bottom. It says that we have 470 less than budget, correct? Okay, 470K. Right. So is that what you expect or is it something happening here or is it going to be corrected in the coming few months because of some- uh, uh, No, it's, it's, that's because of that $450,000 GNA allocation, Bertrand, that's skewing that number that I had that's that's why that's there. It's it's not you have to take into account that four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So right. exactly. it's, we're not at, we're only down by 
what it would be like 60 20. some odd yeah, thousand yeah. dollars. Okay. Yeah. That's my answer my question. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, moving on to cash flow. Um, through the month of April, total operating cash was at 2.9 million, which is 287,000 better than plan. Um, and uh, if it looks like we are going to end the year uh, right at about $250,000 better than plan. And uh, moving on then to budget variances, the only thing uh, that's that changed was obviously the cost of purchase power through March of 2022. And again, what, why is, is, is there a difference here in the cost of purchase power? Uh, because we budgeted it at 6.5 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and it, we should have budgeted at 8.5, which is what had yeah. been for the okay. past, and that was corrected. And yeah. it's I remember now. Budget. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep. And that includes us buying the, the higher rec, 100% rec, which mm. wasn't included in the prior budget, even though we adopted it earlier. So it'll be it, that will be included in the next year's budget. But since it happened halfway through, it wasn't changed. Okay, any questions on um, 9A for Kelly? Okay, uh, then the next several items are all related to the next year's budget. And um, starting first with uh, item 9B, this this is showing us the assumption, this is based on the assumptions that we um, discussed last month, and this is shows how they end up in terms of actual numbers. So Kelly, any? Um, I, um, Have any I'll, comments? Sure. We're just going to mention a, a couple of the bigger um, changes to the budget. Um, uh, if you'll move to the fire department uh, fund there, um, you'll notice that operating expenses for 2023 are significantly higher uh, in 2023. And that was due to the fact of uh, budgeting for $80,000 worth of um, consultants for the special tax that uh, we're considering uh, for the fire department fund. Um, so that's why there's such a large jump in 2023 um, for fire department. And then um, really the only other big changes um, we added uh, in uh, the electric fund and the wastewater fund, we added $15,000 uh, additional and additional expenses for a, um, what is that called again, I, Rick? The, I think it's the spill prevention plan. Yeah, spill prevention plan. Thank you. Um, so we added that there uh, in uh, electric and water. Um, and then uh, also, if you'll uh, uh, move to the electric uh, fund, um, the you can see the base rate uh, increased uh, to one hundred and twenty dollars and forty three cent forty three cents, and that's assuming an eight percent CPI increase. So the portion of the base rate that is not um, related to um, our fixed cost is uh, it came out to be one hundred and twenty dollars and forty three cents at the eight percent CPI. For the following year, which which did you, what did you to choose for the increase of CPI for the? I think 24? we went eight five three three three. Okay. Eight five three three. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously this will actually change when the real numbers come out, but they won't mm -hmm. come out till mid June. So that again, it's a budgetary placeholder, but yeah. that's what the board agreed to. So that's what we did, and mm -hmm. it's eight point three. If anyone saw the April uh, Bureau of yep. Labor Statistics, so we might well, be here. Actually, for the West, it's 8.7. Oh, for San Francisco? Paris, yeah, no, yeah. for region. So the West region include uh, uh, Washington, uh, Portland. Uh, yeah, we uh, use the uh, San Francisco is the one yeah. we use that might even be higher, Bertrand. I don't, we'll, yeah. we'll know yeah. in mid-June. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you, you use 8%. That seems more realistic than 7 for this year. 
Um, and uh, other than that, um, like uh, Bob said, uh, it was just applying all the assumptions to, to the numbers. So unless there are any specific questions, um, and if you have any, and if, if you have any comments or questions or changes that you would like me to make, if you'll email those to me so that I can apply them um, to the next iteration of the budget, which will uh, include the cash and balance sheet portions. Okay. And John and Doug, I know you discussed this in the finance committee. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think we're comfortable with um, with what we've got budgeted. Um, there are some items, the strategic plan funding. Uh, there's four different projects in there that uh, I know I've talked to Eric about as far as their... Uh, That'll come up on capital, John. Yeah, I guess we could wait for capital to talk about that. Okay. Uh, I have one comment on on this budget thing and that's related to uh, snow removal, but we have a specific item of snow removal or should I wait there or should we talk about it now? Of the budget? Probably do it under snow removal because that's okay. where everything mm -hmm. lives. That's why I didn't mention snow removal too for drawn because. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, then why don't we uh, move on to capital projects? And here my suggestion is is discussing whether things are in the right priority. And then the overall numbers uh, will, we will uh, we'll ask for approval or not next month when we actually have the cash flow to compare it to. But for right now, we're looking for feedback on priorities. And there were some formulaic errors that uh, John caught, which I've since corrected, but are not corrected in this, but they will be in the next iteration. So good job, John. Fixed, yes. <laughs> So John, if you had like now, we could just skip to the the, oh. the portion. Yeah, well, this is no priority. I guess it is a priority issue. Is we've got um, let's see, one, two, three. We have about we have, we have four four hundred thousand dollars for uh, basically plan studies to be done by consultants. Correct. Uh, in the water, wastewater, uh, fire, the one that was just mentioned, and electric. And my question to Eric, who I thought was worth just a short discussion is, do we want to do all those in one year? One year? Uh, just a lot of money. And then I asked Eric how much staff time and management time that would take. I think he's comfortable that if it was done by consulting, that staff and management could support those. But I, it was something I thought was worth a, a short discussion. Yeah, and and I know Peter had some comments with which I concur, but I'll summarize and Peter jump in if I mischaracterize what you said. Okay. But but one of the components that we need we need desperately to review and update is our connection fees. And without having a master plan and knowing what our long-term plan and needs are, will it'll be less defensible if not indefensible if challenged without some backup as to why our connection fees are accounting for this tank or that pipeline or this generator or that battery. Not having these master plans in place would severely limit our ability to update our connection fees, which haven't been updated since before I got here. Um, 20 so, years. Uh, four, what am I almost, I'm almost on five, I think. Yeah. yeah. I'm in my fifth year. I don't yeah. think they've reviewed in 20 years. <laughs> so it, that was that was my concern for getting this done, John, is getting these getting these done is a necessity to get that updated. They're woefully out of date. Just to give you an idea, a rough idea, our water and wastewater connection fees are about a third of what Amador waters are in their various systems. Um, so we're we're definitely behind the times mm -hmm. on that. So this would help us facilitate a defensible connection fee um study that we could do that in-house the sub the following year so that, that's one reason that I wanted to push them all through um at once and there is some you know between water and wastewater there's some economy of scale with you know possibly using the same consultant for that aspect but it's a different specialty for propane it's a different specialty for electric um and then the 
fire one you mentioned that's a that's the special tax one that's a whole different animal right um, but we'll but we'll be considering mostly you know labor but also some you know equipment component as well as they uh, prepare that so um i did take that out of capital that uh, the fire one john it shouldn't have been there it should have been an operation because there is no physical infrastructure that will ever result from that so that's it got moved over that's why kelly had it in hers that she mentioned yeah, right. um, in there as well so yes it's going to take a, you know a lot of time we are going to have a lot on our plate and we'll be using a lot of consultants i guess i, I if i can comment i have a, another question on uh, what's the impact of the mellow roost agreement on uh, our connection fees my understanding was that in the mellow root, if you're then making mellow roost payments, it's in lieu of connection fees. And there's a discount they receive. Um, it's a discount. Yeah, it's 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 a lesser amount, if I recall correctly. I mean, I think that's something we need to review and, and clarify yeah. going forward. I mean, we yeah we we can't change the methodology of it now. We can't go back and. Do I understand that. that, but I think we yeah. we need to kind of predict the impact of that. What that's going to be. Because the there has the development has been delayed by twenty years, <laughs> uh, and you know I'm getting a sense that that is about to change. But, it is definitely you know, changing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think we want to be when it comes to development, we want to be ahead of the curve and, and not behind, and, and trying to justify what we're doing. Because you know developers typically they're going to question every fee that you throw at them. Okay, uh, any other comments on capital projects? Yeah, I'd like to, following on that topic of, uh, initially I was mostly concerned on wastewater, but now that uh, Eric has indicated that might be some economy of scale by having water and wastewater done together by the same guy, uh, I, I, I would I'd think these studies are less critical than the other studies that we need to have for connection fees and other other reasons actually uh, we just actually uh, have spent some money to get this uh, uh, plan for the wastewater treatment uh, refurbishing and so we do have a pretty good idea of what what's at stake here since this is the main element and uh, so my, my recommendation here would be to delay this water and wastewater by another year. That gives us the time to complete the current project and uh, any unforeseen uh, event through that process could be taken care in consideration if we do so. So this would be my recommendation and priority is to delay by a year the water and wastewater and just move forward this year on the others. And that would also spread the load of work for, for, the, for the staff on, on two years instead of having everything done in the same year. That would be my recommendation. Anybody want to comment? Well, um, I mean, wastewater is going to take more than a year, the project will be probably a good goal for this year to be get the bid process completed. Well, we, I think we, the, yeah, I'm sorry. The ahead. other issue is that the wastewater um, distribution, a collection system. Correct. And what I mean is-, is And, is, and disposal. It, yeah, uh, so I, I think we have a good handle on the treatment plant. Uh, everything else is in a little bit more of an unknown of an unknown state. And if we did delay that, then we would do the connection fees in two, we, could, we couldn't redo the connection fees in those until, until in that additional year. That, that's the trade-off. Or water and wastewater. We don't need to do connection yeah. fees for, for everything together. So no. uh, yeah. I'm but, just saying that uh, uh, that would well, be the well, disadvantage. Yeah. So the, Matt, the other again, component. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, the other component um, 
from an engineering perspective. So th that's what the master plan is. It has to do with your capital improvements. It's it's nothing else. It's just what is your long term capital replacement and improvements and rehabilitation for the system to keep it running. And if there was any growth, what would be necessary for that? One thing I can tell you right now, um, there's never been a master plan done. We just got a water model done, which is great. That actually helps. So every time a new development comes in, we can make sure that they don't adversely impact existing customers. We don't have that luxury with wastewater. We don't know how big our lift stations are, but we know they're undersized. So if a new subdivision wants to come in, how much do they need to improve that lift station? What is it gonna cost? What is their proportionate share they need to pay to improve that lift station? We have four subdivisions coming in right now that I'm dealing with the developers on. Not having that information, I don't know how short of telling them to bear the whole brunt of building new lift stations to deal with a capacity issue, um, what else we could do without a study. So I, I would very strongly push back that wastewater is not needed. Um, if anything could be pushed back, it probably could be propane. Yeah, I, I agree, Eric. I really don't think we can delay on this. We've been, we're, th we're, we're way behind the curve when it comes to wastewater, the, the whole project and our, our ability to, to safely issue will serves. I, I think we're pushing the envelope. I think I don't see it delaying anything. Okay, point taken. Uh, actually, I'm not part of operation, so I don't have the same inside information. That was my outside information, but I am uh, comfortable with uh, uh, argument push forward. Okay, we would make a final decision at the next meeting. Yeah, go ahead. If you want to push Sorry. propane, that, that would be one you could potentially push. Okay, why don't you consider that once we have the cash flow uh, and next meeting, then we would uh, finalize. Okay. Uh, that is about. Let's put on the table the idea that maybe propane could be deferred, since we know we've already decided there won't be any major new, uh, <laughs> at least uh, you, connections for it. Right. Right. I mean, uh, okay. I, I think we actually have a pretty good handle on what that project or what that master plan could look like. So. Okay. I, so I, you I can agree. consider that and let us know what you think next okay. meeting. Okay, are there any uh, suggestions or questions on terms of the priorities on any of the other sheets? So uh, on the capitals themselves, I do have a list by page of questions and sure. comments. So I don't know exactly yeah, what no, we are going for. No, so yeah, page, let's do it. Let's, let's so do it. page 30. Okay. Uh, so the, my first question was about the rationale to go ahead on a new well in the next fiscal year. So my point here was, is uh, ignoring the Timber Creek snow, remove, snow making. Huh? Uh, we, we don't seem to have a supply issue as of today. And uh, there are no, I, I don't see the urgency of actually making the expense of a new well at that stage. Again, I'm not part of operation, so that's my only chance to be able to ask questions on these topics. And, yeah, uh, then, then, okay. uh, yeah, I'd be, yeah, I'd be happy to-, to, yeah. to Let's respond. cover that yeah. now, yeah. There, there, is a, there, there is a potential supply issue as we continue with uh, these new subdivisions coming in. I'm very concerned about our water supply um, as growth uh, suddenly ramps up. Um, if we didn't have all the growth coming in, we could probably limp, push this out another year or two but I don't know that we can afford to do that. And we also are having iron and manganese issues in our main producing wells, which we've been able to mitigate by using them, rotating our well usage less. Um, we've finally stopped having fecal coliform issues in our uh, shallow well, again, by reducing usage. So the way we're using the wells now is um, proper, uh, in my opinion, as a registered professional engineer. And it's, causing capacity issues because we're having to do the things that are correct. Uh, yeah, my, my next question would be related to Timber Creek snowmaking here is if- That's, and not, a, are, and, that's and, not a capital project, Bertrand. Uh, it, it needs water. So that's oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, you know what I mean? 
I'm with you. Uh, he, he need water and it actually a concern at, and we are keeping monitoring on it to see if they can keep going ahead. So it actually make our supply at some time marginal. So my question is, should we actually make well share a fair share of that investment since actually part of the problem is the fact that they use our drinkable water to make snow. Um, okay. That is actually going to be going before finance in June um, with the options to, if they were to come in as a, um, a regular connection and as if they were, you know, any Joe Smith off the street, um, what would it, what should they pay as a connect, you know, in terms of connection fees and whatnot. So that yeah. is coming up on the next finance uh, agenda in June. Okay. So then I'll be back to the board after that. Yeah. So that was one of my concerns for that page. Thank you. So my, uh, my, generally, uh, uh, so you are saying that we are, we need basically 250K to do a master plan for water and wastewater. Or do you think that can be done at a, that sounds like a lot of money. That's basically why I'm asking here. That's uh, about that's about half what um, Amateur Water just paid, respectively, for each of those. Yeah, but Amateur is, is a much bigger entity than we are. So they're not much bigger. But I worked there. I actually know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have firsthand knowledge. It sounds like, uh, I mean, we, the last time we did a study for, uh, what was it for? Uh, it was only 50K. There's never been uh, a master plan no, study. Before. No, no, there was no master plan. You're right. Yeah. It, was, it was a rate study. It was a rate study, yeah. Right, that's correct. The whole okay, thing. next question then. Page right 31. Okay. So I already mentioned that, that basically, uh, that my first point, we already talked about it. Uh, the next question was about the centrifuge, the way it show up, and uh, it actually split it in in two different. That especially one. So you say fifty percent is actually paid this year through capital, and then it goes through the. Or it also show up in the. I guess it's the other fifty percent. I suppose this is part of the refurbishing of the wastewater treatment plant. Yeah, part, part of it is capacity, part of it is replacement. So my question is, is this is going to be doing through that uh, wastewater or treatment plan, which we just got finance from, financing for, why is it split on these two different levels here instead to be fully allocated to the refurbishing uh, project? Because the current um, the current equipment is undersized, and so this is bringing in a capacity component because it's right sizing it for the treatment plant capacity. Eric, my understanding is it's all paid as part of the project, but we separate right. what's capacity improvement as opposed to what's maintenance and replacement. Right. That we 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 keep track of that, and this is a project that's half fixing what we have and half um, extending the capacity. Correct. So it's three just how we're accounting. That, for, it's yeah, how we're accounting for it, not yeah. how we're paying for it. There's three components that, that in the USDA project that uh, improve, could basically improve bottlenecks and capacity. Oh, okay, I got it. Uh, I, I think uh, Bob and Stark clarify my question actually. Thank you. Uh, page 32. So you have a, a 20K walk behind snowblower. I'm curious, what kind of brand is that? Oh, I have 5,000 for a walk behind Oh, 5,000, yes. So I was wondering, well, actually, yes, I miss, uh, it's a 35. So it's basically you are buying a new one every uh, so, much, so many years. Yeah, it says right there on the spreadsheet, 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, and then the next question is, so washer dryer, that's the same question actually. Okay, page 33. So here we have a major expense on hot water heater, which I'm assuming here what you show is for replacement in kind. And, and there was a discussion of the 
appropriateness of this tech being used. Again, I'm not part of operation, so I'm, I'm not privy to this discussion. So I, I want to know if uh, this cost that you have now is considering replacing to uh, the technology to something that is more maintainable and less expensive to maintain. Uh, we did talk about that in another committee um, and we were going to bring it back to the full board for discussion, um, which was operations. And um, so, uh, yes, um, there is another project we could undertake to provide venting uh, yep. in housing, which was coring through the building. Um, and then we could use regular, you know, regular equipment instead of the specialty equipment we have to buy now. Okay, so that so basically it's this budgeting here, and this money could be decided to be allocated to this new project that you are talking about instead of, of going ahead. Yeah, it's we, this ex, expensive, uh, maybe not appropriate technology for us, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that would be something to consider next year is to do that the coring yeah. project. It would be, you know, it would be. When I last estimated, it was going to be about twenty-five thousand, but that estimate is many years old, so it's significantly higher now, given the current co mm -hmm. contractor economy. Page thirty-five. So here, this is electric. So there is actually, besides the master plan, there is nothing showing up as a budgeted expense in the coming fall. In the next four year, I mean, not this year, but the next four year, yeah. And and I think, and that could be part of the discussion in demand, but I want to talk about it here at the budget as well, which is, I think it's time for the district to go ahead and make sure that we have hourly reading on every single account in the Valley, including KMPUD and uh, VEL. So, uh, we have a, a good measure of the demand uh, demand capacity and demand uh, load that we may have. And uh, it also would allow for, if we decide one day to go for demand charge, and that's a different topic, we'll talk a bit about it later. But anyway, I think here, I would, and it's, on, it's, I don't remember the number, but it's not that many accounts that need to be actually bring up to the, 21st century, and, and I think that, sh that should belong here in this electrical uh, capacity uh, component. Hmm. Uh, I did, uh, Bertrand, I did ask Brandy to be able to comment on which meters could be upgraded to hourly read. And mm -hmm. so, Brandy, if you're available, could you just let us know what your thoughts on that? Um, sure thing. So, uh, with the upgrade to census, um, the reporting software. Uh, right now, we can't get the backside reads. We can't get the cables um, snowmaking pump reads hourly just because of the distance. The other ones that I know of are the um, solar uh, net metering meters that we have out there. Um, those we would have to talk to census. Um, I think that the meters themselves would have to be replaced. Um, I know that most of them would because most of them are not census meters. Uh, so those could potentially be upgraded. And then I'll have to review our manual read sheet just to see which other ones are on there. Um, that's the majority of them, though, is uh, is the ones that are far from our office here and the net metering meters. So could the relay technology could be looked at? So we actually got repeaters so we can still read. For the, uh, for the back remote. side? Yeah, for the remote, yeah. Um, unfortunately, the way our census system works, they um, the meters will talk to each other. One meter will talk to the next meter, but they don't leapfrog over. So the ones on the back side, we're not going to be able to get remotely unless we install another base station at the top of two. That's, um, what, I was, that's what I was meaning, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, eventually, if Vail finishes uh, their backside line project and goes forward, we might have that problem solved too, because they would put in a meter at the base of one. Great. If so, can any of these meters be installed to be measuring in in a more uh, hourly fashion, but only read 
in a manual or downloaded in a more manual process as opposed to having to get it remotely over the air? Yeah, I'm we, not sure. Um, we, we don't have the capability to talk to a residential meter um, directly with a computer with the census meters that we have out there. We can connect a computer to the uh, commercial meters. So the lake pumps at Caples, for example, we could connect uh, a computer to uh, whether we could configure that to download a slate of hourly reads. I'm not sure, uh, but we could look into it. I just mean that as an alternative to the radio yeah, automated seems... transmission, because the, the issue I think that what we're trying to understand is how are people using the energy? And I understand the, I don't want to have to make you take a snowmobile over to the backside to go get that read necessarily, but, and that's still annoying. But if, you know, from a data perspective, it seems like we might be able to get halfway there potentially. Yeah, maybe collect it at the end of the season. Uh, you know, if we could have something that basically download the data somewhere on site, that would be working. I like your suggestion very much, Doug. Um, okay, let me see to the next stuff here. Um, page 36. So I don't see, so one of the problem we have on propane is actually safety. Uh, and the safety is because we don't have cup stops for every single uh, meter, especially for the oldest one. Uh, and I think this is something that should be high priority because of safety issue. It's already uh, included, Bertrand. It has been for quite a few years. Hasn't changed. Still there. Okay, but it's still not in. The, it's still deferred. I mean, I'm talking about priority here. It's not. It's a two. I, I would suggest to move it to a one actually because I think safety should not be delayed. That'd be my recommendation. And uh, so I want to actually uh, acknowledge and compliment on the fact that I've seen that the heavy uh, utility vehicles have been included in most department uh, over the year, indeed not in one single shot. And I think that's actually a, a good uh, move. Page 39. So I see here some playground capital expenditure and I want to ask, is this going to be paid from the remaining fundraising money, or is this something that KMPUD is going to pay? This one would be paid from the remaining because it's part of the same project. Yes. This one's a grant. So yeah. We already have a grant for that. Yeah. Yeah. So that answers my question. Thank you. Then page 41. Okay. Um, so my, it's also a technical question. Again, honestly, I, I'm a bit, uh, and I, I won't say, uh, have misfeeling on this committee system because uh, there a lot of information is not happening, we, is not percolating through the various parts uh, of, of the, the district, including the directors. And then we don't have all the information uh, for actually to have a good understanding of what's going on. So that's why I'm asking so many questions because this is actually my, my only opportunity to do it uh, for this kind of stuff. So here, I want to know for the heat pump and infrastructure uh, phase one, uh, does that include the upgrade of the electrical panel? Yes. Okay. That's why it's more expensive than phase two. Phase one okay. includes the full upgrade for yeah. both phases. Uh, and uh, so since there are there was basically four units initially in the initial project. So here you would install how many units on this? Uh, they actually got it down to two to two units. Okay. We were told in the latest uh, estimate, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, correct, Rick or Brandy? Yes, that's correct. It's two. Okay, thank you. Next question I have is I see a 10 wheel dump truck. So what is that? Is that? It's a it's a dump truck with ten wheels. <laughs> I understand. It's pretty self-explanatory. I don't I don't know how to okay. explain it better. Okay. No, I, so I, I, I that's what I thought thing. it was, but now no, no, you, why you do we right, need that? <laughs> uh, so when we need to pull the when we need to move the backhoe, let's say we need to take the backhoe out to work on the out valley line. Right now we drive it on the highway, which technically we're not supposed to do without two pilot cars and all sorts of things and possibly a CHP escort, but we do it because that's the only way we can get the backhoe there. 
Uh, yeah. We need something that can put a backhoe, tow a backhoe on a trailer that has enough weight to hold it back on some of these hills. And that's what a 10 wheel dump truck does. It also, you know, allows us instead of having to take a bucket of dirt and debris from the playground and drive all the way around on Kirkwood Meadows Drive to the district to dispose of it, we, they can mm -hmm. dump it into the 10 wheel. It's a huge return on investment and uh, labor inefficiency that we currently experience. Very good. Uh, I, uh, I, actually, when I read it, I understood it would be something for the trash. And actually, now I understand. So yeah, uh, uh, it's not for the trash. Just think of a dump truck. I mean, really, yeah. that's yeah. the lay, yeah. lay person's term for it is a dump truck. Sounds good. So I'm, sorry. I'm just, I was just curious about it. Thank yeah. you for the clarification. Yeah, absolutely. Page 42. Nope, no. Nope. So yeah that's, that's no capital. yeah that's yeah that's so we are back to exactly so i will okay. wait for the snow that was my question uh, and thank you Bertrand, for, thanks for the those are those are all those are all great questions thanks for those um are there any other questions on capital projects if not we'll move on to uh 9d okay not hearing any on 9d we're really looking for two things one is an agreement from the board or not that we're continuing the methodology that we established uh, last year. So confirming that. And then the second question are, are the actuals that we'll discuss, but the first is the uh, methodology. So go ahead, Eric. Uh, sure. So um, I just took everything that the, the board agreed on last year and we've massaged this thing for so many years. Um, if we change methodology midstream, I, I think I'll tender my resignation. I've had enough. <laughs> but uh, we set uh, the district at 3%. Um, anyone that reviewed the numbers knows that the 1.9 actually dropped to 1.7, but I just kept it at the 3% um, since that was a hard fought battle to get consensus on. Um, I did account, I did address the new landmark and adjustment to Sun Meadows 2 landmark um, as well. Um, so that has been included in the um, analysis. And uh, the only other uh, new recommendation is to use um, a one-year average for Sun Meadows 2 because of the new landmark. Because a three-year average makes no sense since they had a much larger landmark and we're correcting that. So um, that said, that's the overview. Um, the operational budget, um, just so we can pay for the... Uh, can we... Comment on the overview first yep, yep, before sure. we go into details. Okay, so um, I, I think the methodology was effectively painful to come up uh, after many years of work together, but actually I'm pretty good feeling about it now and I don't think we should revisit it, except that I was hoping to be able to have the data so I could actually look at in a statistical fashion at how uh, how well it performed this year. I'm pretty comfortable it's going to be just fine, but I, I did not get the data. And you say you would send it to me, but I don't think you did. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've received it. And so that would be something that actually prevent me to say, but please go ahead because I would, uh, I was hoping to be able to, to make a, a QC assessment of what happened on the snow removal front this year. It's always nice, I think, to have another set of eyes looking at the same data that you guys are looking. And I actually, uh, I was offering to do that, but I was not uh, afforded that. Then uh, the, on, the, on the budget thing, um, let, let me see, hold on, I have my little my thing here. Um, so- well, Let me, the, maybe the, I should walk through what I did on the budget before we- Okay, that's correct. Uh, so that's, for yeah, the yeah, benefit yeah, of the other yeah. board members? Yep, yep. Um, so what we did here, um, just because we have to purchase a track list a year earlier than we thought we were going to have to purchase it, we're not going to build the sufficient reserves to buy it. We, we will not have built them this year. So a um, couple of things. One, we have a bit of a surplus, which is great to use for the purchase of the track list. Um, between that and the deferral of the loan payback this year, um, we did pay 50000 last year, but with the deferral this year, um, we can actually should be able to pay cash for the new trackless machine. Okay, stop me here. You said at the last meeting when we talked, you said we did not pay last year 50K. 
No, I was recommending we don't pay it this year, 50K. You'll you, notice that the loan amount went down about a little little under 50,000 or right at 50,000. So we, I recommend we don't pay it this year. This is the projected year end totals. This is the zero, the zeros yeah, right there. Okay, so I must have misunderstood you, but what I recall is that you said that we have not paid last year, no, and we won't pay this year either. And I was actually surprised and I'm glad to see we did pay last year. Okay. Is there any other questions on the, the budget, the operational budget? Well, then you yes. put a 3% 3, 3 increase in, right? 3%. Uh, yeah, in essence, it's the, the increase I'm proposing from here to here is just about 3% from six, seven, 676 to 700. It's about 3% increase overall. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's my other problem, actually. Uh, this is what this department is basically Q1, which is not standing on its own and has to rely on the interfund. Uh, and every other budget, we go 8% because this is what we expect the CPI to be this year. Why are we not doing it for snow removal? I mean, is there a specific agenda that I'm not aware of it? Uh, to no, me, it, doesn't, it makes repeat, no sense. I, I'll just repeat exactly what I just said, which answered your question. Um, because we have a surplus and with that plus the deferral of the loan, we can buy a trackless for cash next year. That's why. I resent the uh, accusation of a secret agenda too, by the way, that's ridiculous. No, I'm, I say, I'm asking, no, I no, just you don't made an accusation. You weren't asking, you made an accusation. Okay. I don't so, appreciate that. That's very uh, hostile and unprofessional. Well, actually uh, on hostility front, uh, if you want to open that subject, I don't think- Why don't we, uh, uh, let's yeah, stick yeah. to the snow removal place, yeah. everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I, I disagree with that. I think we should stick with the 8% increase of budget. I'm glad we had a surplus this year so we can actually purchase this, uh, this thing, but it doesn't mean we should uh, reduce the, and, and you, 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 so next year, you, you, what are the percentage of increase you have for the next years? I, I didn't do them as a percent increase. I actually did them based on the budgetary needs, not just an arbitrary percent increase. So, yeah. so okay, based, on, I, based I, on capital we had to purchase, you know, you'll see we're starting to build a little bit of reserve, a little bit more, a little bit more, then we buy a track list and we have a little bit again. It goes to what you said, you want it to stand on its own, this budget lets it stand on its own. I, I agree, but I think we should actually treat it like we treat any other budget, which is 8% this year and five, five, three, three, or something like that. that you, um, I, I just want to, Clarify something, if I can, Eric. It looks to me like operating expenses did go up eight percent, but part of that is covered because we have some surplus revenue we're moving forward. Correct. So the expenses are tracking CPI. It's and just the revenues are have some carry forward revenue that we're that we're crediting in our debt on salary. If you remember and payroll right. from the assumptions, so the salary yeah, and the operating expenses are eight percent higher. So it looks to me like the only reason the revenue re demand isn't going up 8% is because we're we're carrying forward some revenue from this year. Is that correct, my understanding? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, is there consensus we're gonna, you know, Bertrand would like to look at the data, but, but not, assuming there's no things that stand out that we would go forward um, with using the same methodology as we have continuing that. Uh, that that's what I'd like to see. Okay, uh, Peter, Doug? Yeah, I, I concur with that. Yep. Uh, okay. I, I will not be able to vote for a budget if I cannot see the data. I think it's critical that we have- Yeah, I understand. You've, and, you've made uh, yourself clear there. What yeah. we're doing right now is just agreeing that we want to keep the same methodology. Okay. Uh, Eric, is there anything else you want to identify on snow removal? Um, the only thing, and I did include it, but um, obviously we have more data coming in. This is now old. 
um, since we had a snow storm after this occurred and we did plow the roads. So I will update this with the new the newest times um, once period closes on May 15th. Um, and then and I can provide you with the raw data that basically the table that gave me this um, Bertron, which is the same table. It's just in a different format. So I'll send that to you once it closes on May 16th. Well, once I am back yeah. after it yeah, closes on May yeah, 16th. No, including the raw data, please. So my question on this one actually is just try to understand. So are you, have you been using the three-year average or the two-year average? Uh, last year we used the three year, so this uses so yep. if you if you read the That's what you, yeah. if you read the report yeah yeah, yeah. I I use the three year I, average I, for everyone yes. except for Sun Meadows. So my, the, okay, let me rephrase my question. So you still have the two year average. I would advise to have a four year average because last year we discussed about the idea of ultimately trying to get five years to better even out the impact of different snow years. And, and so working toward that goal, I would think it'd be more useful to have the three-year three average percentage and the four-year average percentage to help uh, the, us make- The only reason I didn't include the four-year average is because there was a lot of uh, corrections in there, a lot of changes to landmarks in that fourth year. The other reason is there's a lot of new driveways coming in. So the older data we use, if we use a three-year average rolling forward, as the driveways added in, they're less significant impact um, versus disregarding them for three years or the prior three years versus you know using four. So um, I strongly recommend we stick with the three-year average like we did last year. For well, this year? For this year, yes. And next year, you agree we, we should expand to four and five? Uh, avoid no, the time. I, I um, don't agree with that. I think we should use- That's what we discussed year last year. So what does the board member think? There was well, I look forward to discussing that next year. Right at the moment, <laughs> I'm happy to 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 just get consensus on what we're doing for this year. I, I'm fine with the three years for this year. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think then, uh, Eric, you have what you need on the snow removal information. I do. I'll I'll, okay. I'll analyze with the new numbers uh, in two weeks. All right. Well, my goal was to reach this point at three o'clock and it's 304. So we're doing, and we're covering everything. So that's great. I appreciate everybody. Well, I have efforts. two more questions on, on snow. I'm sorry for your goal. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. So the first one is there is no estimate uh, of, uh, of, of minutes and cost uh, for the new uh, landmark which is basically a joint landmark between Sun Meadows one and two and base camp. And, and my understanding is this year, it has been plowed without being charged to anybody. Is that correct? The board agreed to reduce Sun Meadows two's cost to $3,500 for, for snow removal year 21-22 which in effect was to compensate for that. Uh, for, uh, for the joint, yeah, correct. The joint thing. These are the minutes that were spent on the yep. joint shared area and it was split between um, base camp, some meadows one and some meadows two. Okay, so basically this time has been allocated to the various partner of uh, that uh, joint section. Correct. Yeah. Okay. As so I then, said, as I said in the staff report, that's what that, we did. That answer my question, and uh, and and it makes sense if that's the case that you don't have actually uh, a cost for it in next year budget. So I uh, thank you for that explanation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on to item nine E then. And so this really two parts to this question for, for the board. One is to, the first general question is, the uh, way, way you've operated in the past is each um, committee comes up with uh, whatever number of objectives or goals that they have, and those get added up and that, and that gets handed off to the general manager for judging um, uh, performance. Um, my suggestion, is that we change this 
to have um, have it be driven by the board setting setting um, long term goals, things that are going to be uh, you know that will can't be done in a year, but multiple years, and then specific objectives for the next um, next fiscal year, and then once those goals are re are defined, then sub goals could be uh, handed out to the appropriate committees. So that's my suggestion on on the change. And then there's deciding what the specifics might be. So can I first pull all the board members and get their feedback in terms of changing the methodology to be top down instead of bottom up, just to make it short. John, can you? Uh, I would love to. Your feedback? Oh, sorry. Oh, Doug, go ahead. No, no, Whoever. Sorry. Nope. Go for it, Doug. I would just say that this. I think this is a really important move in the sense of um, just looking at how things are structured. I think having up to like 25 different objectives for the staff is, is too many and I think we need to focus so I think narrowing uh, to a much smaller number of, of goals is important um, I think it seems like we've been moving in the direction of making sure that the, the committees and the board overall are moving in the same direction so I think moving to, to having us as a board decide and then having that kind of go to the committees and then work with the staff on implementation I think is, a, is the right direction as well but the only comment I would make on anything that we, well, let me stop there because I'll make my next comment when we talk about specifics of maybe what we will or will not work on. But I'll, I'll just say on structure, I think this is the right move forward. Okay, good. Uh, John? Yeah, I mean, I concur. We reviewed this um, as part of personnel. And I agree with what Doug said and what um, Bob, you introduced is this, this is a, a better way to have better alignment and clarity between the board and management. So I think it's a good idea. Okay, thanks. Uh, Peter? It works for me. Okay, and Bertrand? Uh, I, I, I do agree on some of it. Uh, I, I'd like to characterize on what Doug just said. It's actually, this is really the general manager goals, not the staff. So the general mm -hmm. manager, is it's his responsibility to make the staff helping achieve his goal. But uh, the way, the, at least the way I read it in the director uh, guidebook is uh, our only uh, uh, what we try to do here is to give direction to the general manager, not to the staff. So that's a, that's, that's a difference, actually. Uh, yeah, I wasn't but, trying to characterize it that way. Sorry if that was yeah, the way it was interpreted. Yeah. I, so, I do understand that difference. Yeah. So the second point, I would say I, I'm for it as well, uh, with a, a, still a caveat on the long-term goal. Uh, so my concern on the long-term goal, and I've seen that there was some adjusted adjustment that was suggested by some people, uh, by some board member, uh, which actually I believe falls through some of the, of the existing goal in the long-term section at this stage. My concern would be, for the long-term goal is we still need to have timely delivery. And if we just say it's a five-year goal, uh, I don't think we need to, we can't afford to wait five years to get a strategic plan on anything. So I, I, I'm concerned on, on that definition of long-term goals and how do we measure progress, yearly progress towards that goal. That's basically my concern. Uh, yes, uh, and I agree with that. My mm -hmm. assumption was that there's this long-term goal and then there's what's going to be accomplished within the next year. So if we look at if if these are the specific goals, then we'd say, well, what we have to, where where do we want to end up at the end of five years and then what will happen in, in the next year in terms of long-term goals? So there would be, you're correct, there would be an objective for the next year under each of the long-term goals. But yeah, it's so not a goal we, that would be, yeah. yeah. The goal yeah. is to include a timeline with deliverable, I would say. Yeah, that's basically my, my thing. Yeah, at least the one, at least knowing what we're going to get done in the next year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and, sh and, and should we call it five years goal instead of a long term to be a bit more specific? That would be fine with me. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the time horizon I think we should think about. Yeah. Other than that, I am in full support of this change. Okay. Then the second question is, and we don't have to decide this today. Um, John and I, in talking about this, came up with a first set of, just to throw something out there, of things that we would view. 
uh, I asked whoever else wanted to to add into that. And Doug, do you want to comment on what you would like to add to it? Sure. Or, or, yeah. or replace. And um, the goal isn't to make these as long as possible, but as short. As <laughs> I possible. think yeah, I, don't, I don't want to make them long as I think I think we should focus and we should maybe you know addition by subtraction in a lot of ways and maybe maybe focusing on different things and different timelines. Um, we could always add more later. Um, but I would say that, you know, just from a planning committee perspective, we've been talking a lot about PBC funds. So that is something I think in the, in the fiscal year, uh, that's something I think we'll want to think about. Uh, I've mentioned an, a few times in earlier board meetings that I would like to see us, you know, assuming, and I know we'll have a discussion later today about our current electric rates and how we pay for our long-term costs, our fixed costs. Um, but having some sort of communications plan that is rolled out for every new customer and helps them over the, over their three years as they're thinking about how their AMU is calculated and, and opportunities to change that and facilitate that, I think would be something that would be good to have uh, in the next fiscal year as well. Um, and then in terms of long-term goals, these are just general thoughts that I have that I think, as I noted in my notes here, probably fall under things that are already listed in terms of strategic plans or any of the long-term plans that we're, we're thinking about now, but specifically about battery storage potentially replacing our current diesel, um, and then general electrification uh, in the valley, um, especially when we think about wood and propane uh, converting to electricity as well. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bertrand, Peter, do you have specifics you wanna suggest now or do you wanna think about it and put them in? Because we one thing uh -huh. we could do is try to consolidate this at the next personnel committee and then report back. Actually, I have one thing that I'd like to be incorporated in some fashion in the goals right. for the for the district and the general manager, which is in whenever we are evaluating a new project, a new uh, a, a new uh, topic, I think we need to take the time to evaluate the environmental impact. Uh, as an example. Uh, we are going to talk right after with uh, uh, about this uh, electrical rate, and one of the sentences in that uh, report made uh, that it uh, it says, uh, and the, the argument was basically uh, uh, time of use is of no interest for. I'm just paraphrasing here. Uh, for KMPD because we 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 always pay the electricity at the same rate. Uh, whenever, uh, whatever is happening. And uh, so here, if you take the optic, not about the money or the cost, but actually the impact on environment, it is actually better for anyone, everyone, anywhere, everywhere to consume electricity uh, during, as, assuming there is enough demand and load available uh, during the sunny days, sunny time of the day, because that means we are using renewable energy. And I'd like to be part of a community that is environmental conscientious. And I think MPD need to be a driver there. And we need for every single project to have uh, evaluate environmental aspect of whatever we are discussing. Battery storage, for example, yes, there is going to be a cost but there will be significant environmental advantage to do that, no more fossil fuel uh, and so on. So that would be one of my addition of the goal is making sure that in every single aspect of district activities that we actually take the time to look at the environmental impact of what's going on. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter, anything you wanna add? Not at this time. Uh, okay. Well, my suggestion would be if there's other ideas that board members have for either the immediate goal or the long-term goals to um, send those up through Eric and I'll, I'll ask the personnel committee to try to consolidate them. So we, at the time we approved the budget, we would also approve these goals and then each committee can then take these and look at and say what is their role in assisting. And then Eric can will have the opportunity to uh, Share these with staff and um, sub-allocate as he sees fits for their for their work. And and Bob, if the, the comment yeah. that I was um, withholding until this section is a general comment on any of the goals that we set 
I really, and I think this might be related to what Bertrand was getting at, but I might be in miscorrect. So Bertrand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that I want everything to be uh, measurable and very much to be able to be uh, objectively looked at, because I do think that some of the goals that I looked at for this fiscal year, as I came onto the board, were things like, I don't, I said to Eric, I was like, I don't know how to evaluate whether you've been successful at this or not. And I, what I want, when I think about goals and my own experiences, I see it as two different types of metrics that I like to look at for any goal. The first is the success metric. So um, what is, what does it mean to be success? So, you know, is it, you know, a strategic plan is delivered. I mean, that, that's kind of binary. Um, but the other one is what I consider velocity metrics. What are the, what are the things that we can measure along the ways of a five-year horizon that we know if, if we don't hit that in this quarter or this year, there's no chance of us meeting it in five years from now. And so it's not just a derivative of the success metric, but it's thinking about what, what are things that we need to be doing to drive the success metric. And so my, my ask of us as a board and, and, and as we think about these things is that everything that we come up with has to be measurable and everything that has a goal has to have two metrics associated. Okay, that this, sounds great. Um, can be discussed, but I, just, I want us to be thinking in that way, please. Okay, so we really need to collect ideas so at the next board meeting we could have a set of things to approve as part of the as, as part of the annual budgeting process. That's what I'd ask people's help in. So don't wait till the next board meeting to forward ideas. Um, all right, great. Let's uh, now move into performance reporting aquifer levels. Um, hi everyone. Just briefly to, hi, Randy. Um, hi, to tell you um, the things that I wanted to point out in performance reporting are you'll see in most of the departments that we were actually over budget in how many units we sold. Um, that was just because the resort was open much longer. You, you can see that Propane was the exception to this, and that was just because we had a very warm beginning to April and then it started snowing again. So um, just so that the board is aware that we have noted that. Um, the other thing you'll see is wastewater treatment. All of a sudden, our unidentified unmetered usage is up above 50%. So those warm days that we saw in early April are, um, when we start seeing more inflow and infiltration into our wastewater system. So that's what you're seeing there. Uh, other than that- uh, Eric, Eric, can you move ahead to that chart? Thanks. Uh, other than that- I'm sorry, Brandy, go ahead. No, 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 that's fine. Um, the only other things I wanted to point out are on the charts for aquifer levels. You'll see that May, is um, about what we were seeing for April. It's also lower than we've seen in years past. And with the melt and with the recharge of uh, groundwater, we're hopeful to see that up in June. And I would be happy to answer any questions, but I don't have anything else uh, for that. Okay. On the, uh, on the wastewater treatment- Go ahead. On the, on the wastewater treatment, do you think there was any damage caused by uh, fighting the Caldor fire that's uh, created more openings in the system? We strongly suspect there is uh, in the areas where there was bulldozer work. We know of a couple of areas where um, individual lines from people's houses may have been damaged. So it's on our early summer projects list to do smoke testing and camera work to try to find these. But yes, we are anticipating that we'll have higher INI flows this spring. Okay, thanks. Well, Are there I questions a, for Brandy? I have a quick, I'm not sure if the question, yeah, it's a question. Is, is it possible to add last year, year to date? You add, the last column you have is a year to date for 21, 2022 20, and uh, on your tables. And uh, now if I want to have a sense, I basically have to jump in a year before, I mean, find the packet from the previous year to try to see how we're doing. And I think, especially, for example, I'm always anxious to see how our consumption of electricity is behaving uh, compared to previous year. And I just wonder if you could add another column with the last year, year to date. 
Uh, so you're just looking for a, a year to date. Um, Your last colon current is year to date 21, 22, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You could get the same one for the previous year, I mean, 20, 20 21. That's absolutely a nice reference basically to have yeah I, I can add that there are um and, and I don't know if this is helpful but there are included charts also um, of each utilities usage over the past few years that are kind of in the back of this agenda item um but yeah. if if we would like to add a column that says well, prior okay. years well, that's, today, that's what I was going to say is this this is the actual data you're asking for that and bar chart co format. Correct, but actually I have the same criticism for the website. If I want to see, I don't have cumulative information. So I don't know for year 20, for one year, what the total number. So I will have to take my calculation uh, or do it by head sometimes to try to find how each year compared to each other. So, and we have the same problem with the website where we actually go, when we do yearly, we just don't have a yearly uh, cumul, a yearly uh, uh, numbers. And, uh, and, that, and that's actually useful because we want to track it quick and fast, that kind of a QC. You know, when you do QC, that the first thing you do is, is attack some, uh, try to see so you can pinpoint issues if there are any. And I think it'd be useful to have, it could be here actually, if you don't want to change your table, if you could have for each of the four years, the, the, the sum of it, that would answer the question. And just leave off the current year? Because obviously the current year will, <laughs> doesn't no. have all 12 months. Yeah, indeed. In this case, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that well, these are yeah. automatically generated, so. That, that's what I'm, okay. So actually the, the issue we have actually, I don't know if it's uh, in the website, we are going from hourly, weekly, monthly and yearly or something like that. Huh? And which actually a different paradigm. It should be, I think the weekly and monthly are redundant. I mean, they are not providing. Uh, well, any anyway, monthly. why don't we yeah. keep to okay. performance reporting for so, this board meeting? Bottom line is having ability, a quick ability to see a tax sum for the year is a useful to see a tool. And I would be very uh, happy if I, I could see that. I mean, currently I do it by hand, but nowadays we have computers and I would expect that information to be available. Similarly, when I get PDF, I, I, you know, in, in Excel, you can select an area right away at the bottom, you have, uh, you have the, the sum automatically calculated. On PDF, you cannot do that. So. Uh, it, it is something that the, uh, people use a lot for QC understanding trends yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions for Brandy? Okay. Uh, why don't we move on to item 9G then, standard specifications? So in your board packet, there are a lot of pages uh, devoted to our standard specifications. Um, what we've done is we have developed general specifications for all of the utilities that deal with uh, things that are um, not unique to a particular set of standards. And then you have a unique set of standards for water, wastewater, electric, and propane. Um, these were developed uh, based on what historical documents we had here, what similar utilities use. Um, we've used our internal um, knowledge and uh, experience with our systems here. We've gone out and found de design standards specific for what we're looking um, to do here, which is have a stable long-term system for each of our utilities. Um, th these have all gone through the planning committee. Um, we have addressed the comment uh, that we received that um, we should be looking at environmental responsibility also. And so we've added um, a, a section in the introduction to each of the standards for that to ensure that we will not only look at the lowest cost, but also um, an environmentally responsible solution. Um, and these are here for um, review and comment. And I don't know if Doug, if you had anything from planning that you wanted to add to that. The only thing I would add, Brandy, is you know, thanks again for all the work. This is a lot of documents, um, and we a lot of pages and a lot of documents. We appreciate all the work that your and your team did. Um, the only other comment that I would say that came out of the committee conversations that um, we've asked Brandy to think about is how these uh, standards 
assuming getting adopted by the board, uh, would be then getting feedback from contractors and builders who are using these standards to see if there's anything that was missed or anything like that that we could revise in a future iteration. Um, so we just don't want to make this as necessarily set in stone. Uh, we wanted to take community feedback in making sure that we have standards that are amenable and uh, usable by everyone. So Doug, are you recommending we approve it now, but then also encourage feedback and consider revision? Indeed, yes, Bob. I think we've reviewed these. Okay. We, we, we definitely recommend to the board to accept these as written. But as I said, we want, we want to be a, a good partner in all of these standards. And so make sure that Brandy is done in the past and continues to, to do in the future is to get feedback um, from folks that are working here in Kirkwood to make sure that these standards are appropriate. OK, great. Are there other comments in the document? Uh, I do, actually. Um, I know a long time ago, I have suggested uh, change, for example, in the propane uh, propane uh, enclosure requirement, because I thought we should be specific instead of recommending brand. I'm talking, for example, of free area venting. Uh, and I've not seen this change uh, uh, being included. So I've, I've stopped bothering actually on that. The other thing I would say is, uh, I don't understand why this is on, uh, on planning. I mean, it's typical operation. It should be an operation committee, not planning committee. Planning is looking forward, uh, or strategic plan and stuff like that. I don't think this was the appropriate venue. Okay, uh, are there other comments? Uh, I'm, more I'm, I'm more comfortable with it now that uh, you know we that I'm hearing we're going to solicit feedback on it just because um, there's a lot of detail in here and I'm I'm not qualified to review it as a potential contractor or builder so uh, I, I like that that's a part of the process so given that it seems like a, a good start. And the other thing okay. I would add is that the standards that we refer to, whether they're ASTM, AWWA, mm -hmm. building code, et cetera, those are constantly changing. So this has to be constantly updated just from stuff that trickles, you know, rolls downhill. So it's it's part of the process. I mean, these these will get updated um, as things change, of course. Okay. Are there any other comments? Yeah, I guess uh, going forward, are we going to recommend uh, a certain type of pipe to be used, uh, i.e. plastic uh, instead of uh, metal? In, in what sense, Peter? In, in what? In what? just terms of longevity, uh, you know. It, it depends on the application. Um, if you're talking about water pipe, yes, we're we're requiring C905 uh, pipe which is PVC, okay. um, but our casings will be steel. So if you go into a road, the casing is steel, for example. Um, you know, it, you know, for uh, sewer collection mains, it's going to be SDR. Uh, what we go with 21, I think, Randy, uh, maybe 17, depending on the application. So generally, it's generally almost most of it, most of it, Peter, and I'm not going to say all of it, most of it is, is PVC across all the utilities, but there are some situations where Ductile iron is required for shallow installations of water pipe, for example. Okay, it's so uh, you're, you're recommending plastic when when it were practical. Generally, yes. generally yes. Okay, that's right. a safe general statement. Yes. That's, all right, good. I'm good with that. Okay. Well, given that, I'd like to move that we adopt the uh, the general conditions for all utilities uh, document. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, is there any further discussion? Not Peter, can you do the roll call? Sure. Epstein? Aye. Schroeder? Aye. Perot? Aye. Mediterranean? Aye. Herbert Guy, it's unanimous. Okay. Um, Brandy, congratulations. It's a huge amount of work for you and everyone else that worked on it. Thank Bob, you. just just to be clear, you 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 meant to move to adopt the general conditions and all the standard specifications as well. Yes, the, well yeah, it, it, thank you for correcting that. Yes, the standard okay. specifications. I just wanna make sure that was your intent. So that was my intent. <laughs> so we can and thank you, thank you, thank you for making it exact. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. okay, good. All right, so the next item uh, is the electric rate design update from the temporary committee. Uh, 
And on, on this one, I would say that because it is not time urgent, if we don't complete the discussion, we'll, we'll pick a, some time frame to stop and then continue it at, at the next meeting uh, in order to make this meeting finish on time because there's still several items that have to be uh, completed as part of this meeting. Uh, so uh, there's, there's two parts to this, this update. Uh, the first part, which I'm going to let Doug, Doug really led the lead on, was uh, a number of issues uh, that we looked at in terms of AMUs answering, trying to ask the question, is there some statistically significant numbers that we could take characteristics and, and compute values for them that, that might, be, might be used? Uh, and then we also looked at uh, the AMU, is there ways to detect AMU decreases looking back over the last eight years? So I'm going to turn it over to Doug to summarize what we've learned so far. Sure. Thanks, Bob. So uh, a slightly additional context here would be that this is all assuming the current rate structure and design as it is and the modifications to that where kilowatt hours is the basis of, of a lot of what we're talking about here. So AMU being based off of kilowatt hours. Um, and looking at this. So the first one, again, was on the customer characteristics to see if, in, you know, part of what one of the, the parts, you know, the way that the rate is today is that for new and uh, new owners and, and, and you have to come in for a three-year period um, and then your AMU is set. So would there be a way to just to take, um, you know, characteristics like condo, large and small, single family commercial, square footage, to try to approximate what your usage would be. So then that way we could just allocate that like we do for a new construction uh, for new ownership. And basically the results were all over the place and that the, 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 the goodness of fit of the models was extremely low. And so what you will see is that there are uh, very low squid footage that are using lots of energy, lots, lots of kilowatt hours, uh, you know, independent of size of uh, square footage or even type. Um, and vice versa. And so it's it's not um, consistent and not a good enough fit of data that I think that um, I would be comfortable with saying that we should make all customers fit into these very um, specific buckets based off of those characteristics, given the wide, wide ranges of usages that we see historically over the, the data that we looked at. So that's the first part of the AMU analysis. Um, the second part was, again, another aspect of our current rates is that once the, your three years of, are up, your AMU is fixed uh, going forward. And that means that even if you have energy efficiency improvements or a uh, lifestyle change where you maybe were using your place full time and are no longer using it, um, then this would not be reflected in your AMU because your AMU is, is fixed. Um, of course, on the other on the upside of it, if if you had your AMU fixed and you start to use more, it still remains to be fixed, which is a part of our electrification um, desires. And for this effort, what we looked at is just at you know are there are there examples of of usage patterns where it is uh, measurable and and that and, and uh, ongoing where people have multiple years of decreases and and it does happen. And I think we even got a comment uh, in our written packet today for the board meeting. Um, from one of our owners talking about how they were they were using it as a full time usage, and now that's changed. But yet their their AMU is based off of that full time usage, and that seems like something that they don't find um, fair. So given the rate that we have today, um, my thought and our committee's thought was that this is something that could um, warrant some additional analysis and investigation. Um, I think we, you know, we try to give just a basic look at it, but there are certainly other parameters that we can adjust in terms of the percentage and the durations and things like that to think about it. I do say though that some of the, that, that change does come back. Some, some people have changes that are drop and then they'll come back and change. So we would have to think about what if anything we would wanna do about that as well. But I think that there is something here that um, people do decrease usage and it is measurable and durable. Um, for reasons that I don't know that we want to necessarily get into having to measure or warrant or justify, but I think um, the fact that it decreases significantly by at least 15% is, is something worth noticing and something that we should consider putting into uh, our rate structure. Okay, so in terms of the recommendations on this portion, the first one is we don't see a way to take characteristics and use that to define an endpoint 
for any customer's AMU, but we, there, are, there are likely ways of taking a look at durable decreases. Um, except that, for new construction be, in the first one, Bob. Just, just to, just right, to be... except for new construction, right. That's right. Those are the recommendations. Right. Um, so that's the first part of it. I will open that anyone has any questions or comments. This is just a status report. Uh, it's, it's the first one is what I expected to see because I recall when we were doing the electric rate study, we looked at these sorts of items and it seemed like there'd be large changes from the old uh, rate structure to the new rate structure if we went to this type of uh, methodology. So the first one doesn't seem surprising at all. And the second one, I think, um, probably makes sense to address. Um, but I think we, we need some evidence of a durable change, meaning you know someone con converted from uh, one energy source to another or something like that. Um, I think that would be a, a nice element to have as part of that. Just so somebody doesn't, somebody doesn't take a year, they don't travel to Europe for a year and then come back and get a decreased AMU for the rest of eternity. You know what right. I mean? Mm -hmm. So, John, just to be clear, you're, what you're suggesting is that there is some verifi verifiable um, process that someone would have to, to, to appeal process through or something where they'd have to justify something that has caused the change beyond moving away for a year. Is that your yeah, suggestion? Yeah, I, I thought about it a little bit the way you might contest your property taxes, that you have to go through a process that requires a significant amount of evidence and maybe some sort of application fee or something like that. So um, the transaction rate's fairly low and that someone would really have to feel confident that they've made some durable change. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's one idea of how to do that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so this is an ongoing process, but is there any, are there any other comments on this I, section? I do have comments. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, in that uh, what you've done, usually you're repeating the same mistake that was done in the last previous. Uh, and I think it's a futile point to try to find correlation on specific uh, metrics. Uh, the, the diversity of usage is, is such that it's not going to happen. And, and certainly yeah, and, not- and, 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 and we did the data to confirm that's true. Yeah. So. Uh, and certainly, if you want to do, it's going to be finer statistic. You, know, you are not going to find linear correlation or even uh, nonlinear correlation. You would have to do basically uh, ANOVA analysis and stuff like that to be able to try to find trend and stuff like that. But I don't think actually mm -hmm. this is what we should spend time on it. So uh, it brings me to my first comment on, on the scope of this thing and how we process this thing, which is, in my opinion, uh, okay, so we, as a board member, we are not allowed to have discussion be beside public meetings because this is how we have, we make sure that there is transparency and this is what the Brand Act forces us to do. So we have committees uh, where only two people from the board attend, so the other three are not part of it, so they don't have all the information. And, and then now you just send us a letter saying that you want to constrain the meeting, board meeting to only two hours, which was the only time where we can have discussions on how to make things better. And, and you want to constrain it uh, uh, two hours. So I, I just think, and so you created this ad hoc committee, which is actually, again, totally removed. That is you and, and Doug at looking at this thing. And you come up with a report where you don't even give us any data. Uh, so we can look at it uh, our own ways. And uh, I'm totally fine with uh, anonymized data, but I think we should be able to get the data. Then to the point that we are trying to achieve here, of course, if you are trying to fix unfairness in the system, you should expect there be some change. Otherwise, what the, what the point of the exercise? And, uh, Actually, I'm encouraged uh, by some aspect of it. I'm discouraged by the fact that no effort was made to actually estimate 
the, the elephant in the room, which is KMPUD and, and VAL in your assessment of the thing. Already without them, you can show that there is actually a little correction from residential to commercial. And the fact is, uh, VEL is using our infrastructure mostly five months a year. And, and then we are paying the tab for the seven months it doesn't use it. And, and that is unfair. And that's why demand charge is actually a good idea. And that- well, We're gonna cover the demand next. So let's, let's focus on the first part of this, which is the AMU analysis. Well, I think that is actually a liability for the district because at some point, you know, someone could sue the district to use an antiquated uh, period from 2017 to 2020, let's say we're in 2030, and you are going to tell people you are paying 80% of your base fees based on what happened 10 years ago, I think it's illegal. And I think some people will sue us at some point. So I think that needs to be thrown away and find something else. And I think demand chart is the answer to that. Mm. Uh, as a as the general comment on this AMU thing, is why it, it uh, okay? No, that's actually part of the demand, so I can wait for the demand. Mm -hmm. But I'm disappointed by the level of, of what you did provide us, so I, I can't comment on the data, I don't have it. Mm -hmm. So, this to me is undemocratic. You are basically withholding information and you are not letting people look at it. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments on just the AMU portion? Okay, so the next step is we're gonna look at whether there, how we might be able to look at durable reductions and, re and recognize those. And, and that would be how adjustment makes. I'm sure no one would complain if their usage went up and, and their AMU is fixed. But the other, the other is the is the larger larger concern. Okay, um, moving on to the demand analysis, um, which is based on the document that Howard wrote, and then modified after our initial conversation with them to say, what if the base rate were based on your ten, ten the average of your ten largest hours of usage? between December and March of a year between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. So there's two questions to that. One is um, how, do, how do you find all that data? Um, so uh, as it mentions in here, uh, of our total base, uh, there was um, 728 meters that provide hourly reads. The ones that, the ones that don't, um, are either, uh, are, there's, there's, as it mentions here, there's 35 that, that don't work that way, either because their distance exceeds what can be done or there was no meter available, or in some, a few cases, they just haven't been updated. But the question was, if we just start with the data that we have, um, can we at least determine what that rate would be to, to break even? And so, by going through this and uh, every one of those and finding the 10 largest, uh, average of the 10 largest demand across all of those, you can see that's 5,768 kilowatts. So a demand charge of $40 per kilowatt um, across that would produce the same revenue as the base rate off of those same customers that we currently have. So that was the first thing is what would that look like? Now, this is not a complete analysis because their significant usage in those other customers, but we don't have any data for those. So we first wanted to start with just saying, well, what does it look like for the customers? We do have data. So the summary of that is that the commercial customers would see a monthly increase of about $10,000 a month. The residential customers then of course would see the opposite, a decrease of about $10,000 uh, a month. Um, just to fill in on a little bit of the details, the accounts without hourly meters are quite quite significant. There's several lifts. There's the wastewater treatment plant uh, doesn't have that. Um, I just want to correct a comment that was submitted in the written comments. We did every meter, including the KMPD meters that had hourly reads. The discriminator was just if they didn't have hourly reads, we had no way of determining 
the 10 largest hours, so we, so we left them out. But a full analysis would require that. And those would be about 6,700 in demand charges if, if they were just, if we just did an average, which of course is an oversimplification. The big observation that was on the next page, uh, if you can skip ahead, Eric. So what we did rather than, and I suppose we could have sent every single account, but what we did, uh, back up one page please, Eric. We looked, what are the largest percentage changes across the 10 largest changes, increases and decreases for commercial accounts and residential accounts. Uh, this board decided when we made the rate change last year that our objective was to find a mechanism that in general kept people's payments about the same uh, for the same amount of usage as opposed to a major shift with the exception of customers that are that have very, very low usage and moving them up to some minimum. So for example, if we look at the commercial customers, we can see, uh, and these, these location IDs um, allow us to map back to the original customer, but without revealing who it is. You can see here's a commercial account that currently pays $618 a month in a fixed base rate. It would go up to 4,800. So you, you see you know, a six fold increase on some of these, some of them, or less, but this is this would be the top 10 change by percentage. Correspondingly, in the commercial accounts, there are some that have huge savings. So we can see the account at, at the bottom there. Um, they use 2,187 kilowatt hours on average, but they never use, but their average demand was one. So it's a small usage that goes on forever. They currently pay $1,130 a month, that would drop down to 40. So there's, and, and we didn't show everything on here, but there's a, just a large variation uh, on these. And so as opposed to a strategy that says, we're trying to keep things relatively the same and then let people improve from there, either by uh, cutting usage uh, or by increasing usage, but, but not having to pay more by electrifying. If we look at the residential accounts neck on the next page, um, it's, it's even more radical. We can see a customer with the ID 120, they use an average of 99 kilowatt hours a month, which is a fraction, right? It's, it's less than half, right? It's almost a third of what the average home uses, but they happen to average, but their top 10 hours of use are 13. So instead of paying $69 a month, which is one half an AMU, uh, one half an EDU, which is the current minimum, they would then pay $620 a month for a 780% increase. And correspondingly, if we look at the other extreme, uh, a, a heavy user, someone uses 862, uh, which is more than three times the average household, but never uses more than three, <laughs> and their average for the 10 hours would go from 440 to 120 for uh, a 73% savings. So, in summary, what we learned by looking at the demand charge, you have to look at two things. First of all, what problem are we trying to solve? And then second is what behaviors are we trying to encourage? So there are some customers that could just say, well, I'll just heat my house at four in the morning to 75 degrees, and then I can have that electric heat off during the day and I'll save a bunch of money. And uh, that assumes they could even figure it out. And then there's other customers that that's, a, it's a business, they operate them, their ability to make changes are minimal. So what the first thing this would do as, as a message, it would put a lot of people trying to figure out how to change their behaviors. But in fact, it has no cost benefit uh, to us. So that brings me to the summary, which is that uh, if our, our, unless we wanna change our goal, um, this, this is something that would be very, very hard to explain to a customer. I wouldn't want to be on the support desk asking to explain how to do this. Most customers have no way to figure this out. So instead of customers just enjoying their place, we're asking them to do a fairly significant change in behavior, which has no impact on us in terms of our cost of delivery. 
it doesn't change based on, on these things. And so based on that, it's our recommendation not to proceed any further with this uh, approach. Uh, Doug, do you wanna add anything to that? Uh, I mean, I think I could add a lot of things to this. I have a lot of thoughts on this, but I know you didn't want to spend a ton of time on this today and we can talk about it more another time. I think the other things that I try to think about with this whole endeavor is like, what are we, what costs are we trying to pay for? Like my understanding of this is that we're paying for the out value transmission line and rebuilding the powerhouse, um, which from a demand charge perspective, had little to like the, the the capacity that we built had little to do with those investments. Um, demand charges are one way, by the way. There are many other ways to encourage uh, peak demand reduction. For example, you could put that in the volumetric charge and have a time based rate. You could do a combination of a demand charge and a time based rate. You know, we could even have inclining block rates, which are more of an, a total KWH usage, but that could decrease consumption at certain hours. Certain hours. There are lots of ways of achieving reductions in energy usage and encouraging customers to do that. Um, demand charges are one way, um, but I'm trying to separate out in my mind is like, what is the rate design and what is, how do we recover costs that are nominally related to demand and nominally related to kilowatt hours, frankly, like demand and KW and usage are to pay for that investment, my understanding is mostly because of a reliability decision, you know, whatever that was 10 years ago, not because we needed to increase system capacity because we were at peak demand and we needed to then double system capacity for where we are today, maybe in 10 years. Um, and so if we wanted to implement demand charges in Kirkwood as our base is normal, typical rate design, I mean, you know, I could, I could have that conversation, I think, um, certainly don't know how much we affect system peak given that we're a winter peaking system on weekends, which is like the lowest system peak out there. Um, but we have our own capacity constraints that we need to think of. And there are slight time variances on our rate, my, our energy usage, I think. But I'm just trying to think about this from the perspective of recovering the cost that we are trying to recover via this mechanism, not demand charges versus kilowatt hour usage charges, because those are in my mind, a separate aspect of this. We're trying to recover a cost that was based on off of reliability. And, you know, Severin Bornstein said, you know, last year, something that I, at the time I was like, this is crazy. So you just divide the cost by the number of units and that's probably the most fair way of doing it. But we decided that wasn't fair. So then it comes back to what is fair? Is it usage in kilowatt hours? Is it demand? Is it some just divided by it by the number of units and then everyone pays the same? Is it some combination of all of these things and it's a mixed model of all of them? It just depends on how we're gonna allocate the zero sum game. There will be winners and losers no matter what we do. And what we're trying to think about is who those winners and losers should be in the most fair way possible. I, I support what you are saying here, actually. I think you're in the right direction. What is fair? Um, Actually, there is a trend in the utilities business, especially in the IOUs, which is basically, and especially for solar, basically they want everyone to pay their share of the infrastructure, okay? Even if you don't use it always or as much because you have solar or other circumstances. And, and, and I think actually that, uh, Bob, this is what your mentor is pushing for, uh, Severin Borenstein. Mm -hmm. So similarly in Kirkwood, the, and there, there is a cost shift between uh, not the solar and the non-solar, but between the full-time resident and the occasional resident. I don't know how you call that, people coming a few weekends a year. They say they, these people are basically uh, still benefiting from the availability and the cost of we have spent and sunk in infrastructure and they don't pay much because they don't come much. And, and that's what I think is totally unfair and that the cost shift. And I think it has long uh, pervasive uh, impact on our community. The reason why our community is not actually developing is because young family cannot come live in Kirkwood. There is no school by the way, and we are not taking care of any of that. But uh, we basically, the full-time resident have a, a, a very difficult time being here because they are paying most of the infrastructure through their consumption. 
And, and that's what I think the first thing to address that is having a minimum payment. And actually the demand charge that OWAC sent you the proposal was including a minimum payment and it's not something that you should ignore. And actually that's why your wool analysis is, I mean, it has its merit of looking what's not workable, but this is absolutely not how this should have been sought. And the fact that you work in your little corner without talking to anyone result in all this energy in demonstrating something that is actually not usable. Uh, and I'd like to respond to that because that is not true. Uh, the meetings we had working on this were with Howard. So, uh, so that's not true. Secondly, is so, the, the minimum have charge- not talked to me, okay? The, uh, we're, that's, because, that's, that's why we're having this right now. The minimum has a de minimis effect because it goes away if you use that much power. The minimum is kind of, it says, you better use this power because you have to pay for it anyway. So few households would be subject to that, that it doesn't really change the results very much. So that's why we didn't bother doing it. I totally disagree with that. Okay, I think we should sit down with, with a spreadsheet and look at the things because I, I, that's my problem with the way you do things is you are coming with this number and this statement, which I think are not benefit. Bottom line is, a minimum payment would alleviate the full-time user. But you know, it's uh, the detail, the devil is in the details. You know, have to find the right measure of minimum payment versus the right measure of demand. Demand- Well, there's a minimum payment. We have a minimum payment currently. Yeah. So that doesn't no. really change. We already have a minimum. Well, we have, I mean, just not to be fairly clear, with there, a demand there, charge. There, there it's there not one or things. the other. There are two different things. There's a minimum bill and then there's you know a fixed charge. Like there's a minimum amount that we have to pay every month, which has nothing to do with your KWH. Exactly. But I think, but, but I think what Howard was proposing was a minimum bill, which you are prepaying for KW or KWH, regardless of whether you use it or not. So you pay $50 and your first $50 worth of KWH is, is, is covered, whether you use it or not, as opposed to today, which is if you use zero kilowatt hours, you pay 50, but then every incremental from zero on is above the 50, which is a different structure. So yeah. there's you know, two different things. The base fee but the point is not is, is the minimum that, payment, Bob. Correct. But, yeah, the, I think, but I think the point is, is yeah. that there are, I think what Bob is trying to say is that in general, there, there are a few customers at the prices that we are talking about. Obviously, if we move to like $250 minimum fees or base fees, then, then that would change the calculus. But at the numbers that we've been talking about, I don't, there aren't that many units that have prices that are that low, right, Bob? Is that my understanding? Yeah, opinion? I mean, it would drop, it would drop the, um, the demand charge from $40 by a dollar or something like that. It, it just doesn't change it very much. It has a very small effect. So I guess, but, Bertrand, Bertrand, I guess I'm gonna ask you a question but, that, back to your point on like, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if, a, if, if somehow, how would a demand charge, if I, you know, you're saying that full-time residents are taking an undue burden um, but if I came once a weekend and I used a, you know, 0.2 kilowatt peak demand twice a year, how is that any, how is that different? How, I, I'm trying to understand how that's different. than. Well, okay. That, what's different is peak demand first is have to, it's not just one measurement. You have to take a number of measurements. Sure. So it's if over you, if 9 to 4 p.m. If on you, Saturdays. If you, if with, Let's say, just generalize. So if you have X amount of kilowatt hour that I use across a full year, okay? And someone is a, someone, a full-time resident. And then you compare that to someone that use the same X amount, okay? But is only coming, let's say 20 days a year, okay? So that guy has a peak demand, a demand charge, demand load that are going to be uh, much higher than the person that is very careful and stay live all the year. Okay. Maybe, and, maybe that, not. That's not true, but that is definitely not true. It's not just Absolutely not true. Not true. Because you are only look because you are not picking the data. You, that's why my problem is the way you are taking the data is not the way that is going to actually help people that are full-time resident. And that's what I'm trying to, to address here. As I said, the people who are full-time resident through their consumption are subsidizing the people that are only coming once a few uh, uh, during the year. And I so, think we need to stop that. This I, is unfair. I, I, 
I don't think that. I mean, that's. I don't think there's strong evidence that that's true, but and if 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 that's the problem we're trying to solve, is we is to lower the cost for full time residents. Is that what the that's what the minimum payment is doing? If you do a minimum payment, it's it, the people. But we already exactly have a minimum. Fee. No, you have. We a already base have fee. a minimum minimum. It's a base fee, totally different. A minimum payment okay. is not a base fee. A, a base fee is you you pay that plus you pay your consumption. A minimum payment is if you don't consume, you are going to pay that. If you consume, you pay your consumption. If it exceeds the minimum payment, then you don't pay it. You see the difference? It's totally different. You don't seem to appreciate that. Okay. You, do, do you understand so, the difference or not? I believe I understand the difference, okay. yes. So, but because do you keep saying we have a, a, a minimum payment? No, we have a I'm base. saying the minimum payment proposed by Howard doesn't materially affect what the demand charge is. We just wanted to model the demand charge. Yeah, so now back on the demand charge in, in, in the scheme of things and that's why i think the pud that means the community would benefit greatly of a demand charge is because uh we have a lot of engine running 24 hours a day and they are not very high consumption compared to a lift but they are actually working 365 24 7 and not consistently so I mean, but I guess I, I want to go back to what I said for Bertrand it's, it's, is, is that uh, so I, like, I, I think there is the rate design of how we charge for things like, because basically what you're saying is it's not just, it's not peak demand. It's just, you know, of, of oh, sorry, peak hours that we set a window. It's like of hours that you consumed any energy, what is your maximum demand? You want to basically net out anything else because you're saying if I only, if I only consume over 30 hours, no matter what hour it is, right? Which is actually different than what Howard's proposal was, which is nine to four on, I think Saturdays or both weekend days. No, it's, That's a, it's every day, though, every day of the week, well, December the week. through March, Sorry. December the average March, 10 Sorry. hours. But it's, but, but again, to, to, to the point is that like, that, that's completely different than saying, if I, if I charge my car at night, don't use it during the day. Like, like that's a completely different calculus. It's just when you use electricity. Well, actually, let's talk about that. Actually, I don't think we should encourage people, at least during uh, until we have demand problem, load capacity problem, we should encourage people to charge at night because it's better for the planet if we charge during the day. And I so, think that should be part of the uh, that, Now, that is also not it's true. It's not true. If we peak loaders, if you peak look demand, at the, the peak generation it, is going to be false. You know, if you look at the at the load and supply in California, sometimes there's huge surpluses in the middle of the night from the wind. So it's oh. true that we have solar during the day, we have large wind coming at night. So to make a category statement of the optimum time to charge, in fact, the work done well, at UC I, Davis indeed, I'm said the optimum time to charge may very well be between 12 and three in the well, afternoon. I, I, I'm when the sure you are down. always going to find situation where you, I'm amazed that you are talking like that because we should look at trends. You know, we should encourage people during their load, uh, not in the late afternoon because that's when people we need the most electricity in California. Uh, but uh, we, sh we we should have this thinking about not just us, uh, but also the the, but the California our, and the planet. Our usage in the summer is so trivial; it's not a great use of time. Here, here's the summary where we are, and then we're going to have to move on. Okay, I see. All I see on doing a demand charge is aggravating a large number of customers. Customers that have large bills now getting a huge discount. Full-time customers who have a small bill now getting a large discount, telling everybody you better figure out how to get all of your load out of this time period, except for the lifts that can't do it. It's, it's, it's a category. I don't see any problem that it solves. All I see is is huge customer aggravation behind doing this so i would like to i'm i am recommending that we take this issue and we table it until we actually have a demand issue which may be in five ten years but we don't have it now and it's a waste of time that's my opinion okay so the the problem here is you seem to be focused on trying to shift people from time period and i don't think effectively we need to do that that actually would be a time of use it has nothing to do with demand. What we are, want to use demand for 
is by, and I know Howard went further than that. Howard, went, I was thinking about uh, uh, limiting the competition with uh, with a lift, and that's why he had this period. But let's forget about Howard proposal and just focus on the on the paradigm and concept. What we need to do, I think, is make sure that people that come a little bit uh, actually support better the infrastructure than they do now. And that's where the cost shift is now. The, the full-time resident actually are subsidizing the other the people that just come once in a while and they should pay their fair share. And I think the base fee that we have now, which is as this 0.5 EDU, is not sufficient to actually address that problem. And so that step one and step two now is looking at the demand is a way to actually assess the intensity of the usage. So, uh, and it's just statistical. I mean, you just don't take it as, oh, that guy has run something uh, once for that consumer a lot of electricity, we should charge him very much. That's totally crazy. This is what, I don't understand why you are focusing on peak demand. Uh, it, it clearly should not be the peak demand. Uh, actually, I think uh, in, uh, in uh, our proposal, he was actually rejecting the peak demand. He was taking a number of reading below the peak demand, the, the maximum We implemented one. exactly what he recommended in this analysis, I, which I was a change from his original proposal to looking at uh, the largest average of the 10 largest hours of usage over the winter yeah. daytime. So anyway, back to my point is I think the way to make it uh, to make it sure that people that are not paying their fair share because they don't consume much uh, of the cost of this infrastructure is by having a minimum payment, not a basic a base fee. Okay. And that okay. Minimum, if and, the and, problem we're trying to solve is to make sure that part-time customers pay their fair share. We could look at that. That that would be fine, but this, it doesn't necessarily get solved by a demand charge. I, I agree. Right. There are other ways to do that. I agree, but okay. I mean, it, All right. Then we're uh, making I, progress. Yeah, and uh, I, I think demand. If you don't be focused on the peak charge, which I think is the wrong way to do that, could be used. We agree. As, uh, as a as a, actually you showed it because of, of the way you've done the thing. Uh, right. we, we could actually uh, use that uh, to illustrate the intensity of, of the usage. And, and it's not because we don't have the capacity, it's because it's a good way to actually target the people that not pay the fair share. And I think so, also so for Bertrand, the reason- Bertrand, before you, because I, I wanna, I just, I wanna, I'm asking this question because I genuinely wanna understand what you mean by fair. Because you keep saying that people who come a couple of days a year are not, they're being subsidized by people who use it every day. And, my, and I, let me ask you why you think that is unfair. And I don't mean that in like a, I just okay. genuinely want to yeah. know. What, if someone uses, yeah. if someone it, it uses is, a product okay. 365 that, days a, a year for let two me, kilowatts of every that. hour, why, why yeah, wouldn't yeah. they pay more than someone who comes twice a year and uses it? Assuming that yes, okay. there's a minimum amount that they should pay, but okay. why is that okay. unfair? Like you keep saying it's unfair. Okay. I want to know why. Okay. I, I'm going to explain. 80%, I'm just summarizing, I mean, uh, uh, making simple, 80% huh? of our stuff is fixed cost, correct? So correct. Uh, uh, we, we should actually, anyone who access the system should pay its fair share of this 80%. And currently correct. that's not the case. And we actually improve things with the base fees that we have now, okay? Uh, and, but the fact is, it's, the, I still think it's not going, it's still unfair to the full-time resident because by being a, a bigger user, they are paying a bigger share of the, of, of the infrastructure. And since 80% of the cost is fixed, that's what is unfair. It's because they are paying, if it be 20%, I'd be fine with that. But the fact that the fixed cost is almost 80%, is basically put a burden of people that live in the valley and, and thus have higher bill and they have to pay this much higher percentage of the infrastructure than the people that only come once in a while and they don't pay such a high, big part of the infrastructure. Everyone should pay for the infrastructure. That, that okay, sound, what, do you answer your question? I think so. I mean, I think there's a, a lot to that though of, of 
you know, <laughs> we're, we could just, have, and this is like I said at the very beginning, you could use some combination of divide the total number by 782 or whatever it is, and that's fair because everyone's paying the equal share, but then you're gonna say, well, but Vail's so big, why are they paying the same prices as someone who pay, use one kilowatt hour, or one kilowatt demand? Well, like, we, why we is that, EDU. that's no longer we fair. We use EDU, yeah. yeah. Sure, mm -hmm. but, but my point no, is, is that do. like, you know, EDU, whether it's computed of a kilowatt or a kilowatt hour or some combination of all three of these things, I mean, that maybe that's the optimal outcome here where you're saying, well, fairness has to be all of these things combined because something, but you know, and we're only really using kind of two of the pieces right now. But that, but that is what we're no, trying to I mean, do is come back to saying we have a hundred percent fixed cost, which is this sixty-seven million dollars that we have to pay they, for. How or what is what does fair yeah, mean in allocating that cost? And it could be divide the number by they, a number of units, or it could be some combination of all the things that we could possibly do. Yeah, a fixed right, fair, so, as, a, as a good example, let me finish on that. Is Vell is only using the infrastructure a lot, five months, but we still have access for twelve months, and we long full-time resident pay for 12 months. And that means they are not paying their fair share on the summer. We, I know we split the, the cost more evenly. And actually I'm glad we did it because that's probably why we had able to ski this, uh, this spring in April. But the fact is we, well, the demand charge would work in that direction to make sure they pay sufficiently because of their Excess, not excessive in, in uh, because it's too much, but because compared to others, excessive uh, consumption during five months versus 12. And that's actually something that could be addressed through the demand charge, in my opinion. But I, I okay, so yeah, Go ahead. let me see if, um, if John or Peter want to add anything, and then we need to wrap up the conversation without reaching any conclusions. Not today. Uh, John, uh, you, uh, nothing for you, Peter. John, you want to unmute? Yeah, when we went through the this whole rate study last year, there were some things, obvious things we need to do, which was to you know raise base rates to cover a better cover of our of our on our loan covenants and reduce the exposure of violating those, and also free up property tax money and uh, help enable the wastewater treatment plant capital raise. So those were all kind of no brainers, I think. When we got into the fixed AMU, that seemed to make it much more complex and introduce uh, arguments about fairness because you, your usage is going to change over time, or some some customers' usage is going to change over time. But we wanted to do that to promote electrification. Um, I, I like Doug asking a question about fairness because just claiming things are unfair has a nice emotional tug, but yeah, you have to define what what are you saying is unfair and what would be fair based on what, right? Because I think sometimes when I hear fairness, it's just uh, residents wanting to push costs on bail because it would reduce their costs. Um, I hear a lot about full-time residents. Um, when I hear what analysis has been done, it doesn't seem to uh, make it a really clear statement about fairness. But I guess, if we're going to, I haven't heard what other public comment we're getting about this. I mean, we certainly have a, one individual that's been very vocal with a proposal, and it seems to be a heated discussion on the board, but have we gotten a lot of other public feedback is something in a future meeting I, I'd want to hear about. If we're, if we're getting a lot of public feedback that our rate structure is wrong, that would motivate me more to do something to modify it. And then I'd say if we got to the point of where we want to shift from our current rate structure to something like demand based, peak demand based or something else, I think we ought to retain an outside party to conduct a electric rate study for us. Um, I don't think we're going to make a lot of progress on our own making what looks to be could be major tweaks to a, a rate structure that we have. So I would probably advocate going to an outside, an outside consultant. Uh, okay, so we need to wrap it up for now so we can cover the, re the rest of the meeting. I guess the one takeaway I'm gonna take is when, we, when we're trying to deal with the occasional user, um, we did it by having a minimum EDU 
the minimum EDU we ended up with was 1.5 was one that sort of kept the other customers kind of in their same range. Uh, we, did, we didn't want to go any lower. Um, introducing a minimum charge on top of that, if, if we think the occasional customers are underpaying is certainly, that was certainly something that would be simple to add if it solved the problem. But the, the trick here is to figure out what problem we're, we're trying to solve. And the, the, a, a pure approach of using demand during peak periods just does huge cost shifts, both between commercial and residential, but between other residential customers and themselves, and just doesn't to me could never uh, could just cause huge huge anxiety uh, with with no with no actual benefit except moving costs shifting costs between customers which isn't really what we're, isn't what isn't an obje objective i'm interested in no it's not an objective so, but if there is unfairness you cannot expect to change it without changing who pays what Correct. i mean well, yeah, well we had about 50 <laughs> customers that we, we had about 50, 60 customers that got hit by the minimum that used to pay pay very little. So that happened last time, but the majority of customers were about the same uh, as as where they were. So there's, we'll have to- there, There's a fair shift of, uh, towards Vail too with the- And there's a, there was a shift between residential and commercial when we went to the EDU being based on the average residential. Yes, yeah, so there was a significant shift caused by that. It was like 20%, something like oh, that. I mean, uh, 12%, yeah. 12%. And, and they are positive. Yeah. I mean, that, that's why I voted for, for this uh, rate change last year as well, is there was definitely a lot of positive in trying to do what we have. So the remaining problem is, the remaining problem is uh, this uh, AMU calculation based on three fixed years, uh, 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 and, and that's terrible because there's a lot of side effect and we still need to address that. Actually, that after, we have not made any progress on that front. And, uh, and people can have lifestyle change and there is no reason that they should be stuck in, in, the, in the past because- uh, Yeah, we, we, we agree and we've made some yeah, progress yeah. analyzing that. You'll see there's a proposal for some standard AMU discounts for encouraging the conversion to electricity. Those yeah, are some of the ideas. That's another thing to that needs to be tackled as well is how okay. to make this electrification a reality because it's not happening. Yeah. If you look at the number now, we are basically in consumption pretty close to where we were last year in uh, yeah. what hours. Yeah. So we right. have not seen a shift in that direction. So if we want to see that, we have to work harder. Okay, uh, great. So let's wrap this up. Um, our next item is the wood chipper purchase item I, 9I. Eric? Uh, so I'll keep this as short as I can. Um, I had the opportunity through Rotary to be at a masticating equipment and tree falling equipment demonstration um, serving margaritas and beers and um, talked to, a, I, there was a bunch of chipper vendors there. So I talked to quite a few. Um, there were three that could provide what we needed. Um, we had originally talked about a six inch, but in talking with the vendors, because of our altitude, they all recommended going to a seven inch because the six inch chippers have a limitation on horsepower for their motors. So they thought at altitude, a seven inch would, the higher horsepower would overcome that for us. Um, and this unit we're recommending um, is a well-known brand. It uh, has a about a three month backlog to get it from date of you know, signing the PO to getting it. Uh, the, the next one was a four month backlog, it was a little more expensive. And then the next one was about the same price was a six month backlog. So this went through the operations committee and they recommend we purchase this immediately or at least put the order in immediately. What's the delay for delivery? Three months is what they told me uh, four weeks ago. Yeah. So. Do you okay. So, Peter, do you want to? Peter, do you want to comment on it? Yeah. I, I, th this looks like a, a chipper that suits our needs. It's uh, it's not as as heavy duty as something Caltrans would use, but it's a, a lot. It's in the it's in the mid range. And the main benefit of a Toby Hoyne chipper 
is portability. If we need to take it out down to Bear River or something, we can do it. If we need to take it to a dealer to repair it, it's easily transported. Uh, whereas our current chipper do doesn't meet those demands. So uh, I think it's a, a good choice. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to um, to approve the purchase? Oh. Yes, I'll make that motion. Uh, I'll second. Okay. okay. Second. Is there any further discussion? Thank you, John. Okay. Peter, roll call. Sure. Epstein. Aye. Schroeder. Aye. Perot. Aye. Mita Taranda. Aye. Norbrook. Aye. Okay. Great. On the Thank phone you, everybody. <laughs> as soon as you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll move on to item 9J, policy 130 update. Uh, yeah, Jess is not. Oh, no, she is here. That's right. Jess, do you want to comment on this? Okay, she's probably stepped away from her computer. Um, okay. So this is the revisiting uh, we talked about on the board meeting schedule um, and just put, pulled together some data um, from the minutes of the number of attendees and whatnot um, and recommend we continue with this um, for another 12 months, having the meetings on Friday afternoon. Okay, Are there any comments? It seems uh -huh. to be working. I have a question. Uh, uh, last year, we had a lot of meetings that were actually heavily attended that should have skewed the number, and I don't see it here. So do you restrict which meeting? You yeah, we taking? took out the public hearings versus yeah. the board meetings, because this is about board meetings, not public hearings. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Because, yeah, I would have really driven the number up on the yeah. Zoom. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you're saying we should just have more hearings? Is that what you're saying? I don't know. <laughs> are, are you in the valley, Doug? I want to come see you. <laughs> I can tell you if I am or not. Uh, okay, so um, do you want to motion and It's snowing, as we can see. Yeah. Yeah, right. There we go. <laughs> I just had to look out my window because wow. I thought you were serious for a second. Uh, um. I, uh, do you want a motion to approve continuing this? Here. Okay. Yes. Someone want to make a motion? I'll motion. Dormer so moved. Okay, Dormer and Doug. Doug seconds. Okay. Uh, roll call, Peter. Epstein. Aye. Schroeder. Aye. Burrow. Aye. Minutesaranda. Aye. Dormer Kai. Out of curiosity, today how many attendees do we have? Um, uh, six. We uh, at Right now we have five, but as a total, we had six. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I wish we had a sense. I, I, I missed the part where we could see all the people before. Or can we actually, today we can, can we? Yes, actually. You, yeah, panelists yeah. can always see the attendees. Yes, yes. <laughs> Is that a cat coughing up a furball, Peter? Yes, it is. <laughs> wow. I thought I recognized Some, that noise. That's a, that. Someone has a good ear. Wow. Okay. Uh, Isn't summer it? festival. A oh. uh, summer festival update. Um, again, uh, so um, basically just an update from Jess uh, that they're needing volunteers still. Um, and we're, we're doing all the ticket purchase through bidding for goods, so even day of people will need to go online and purchase them. And then we'll, Rick and I will have the reports and give them their wristbands. It, it really cuts down on the amount of staff we need to have and cash drawers and things like that. So um, that's, a, that's one change they have. Uh, we bought that last year. So we're now using it for ticket sales this year in addition to online bidding, which is again, reducing the load, which is great. Um, we already have a $30,000 donation. Um, anonymous, which is good. And um, Rick, anything you want to add to that since you've been on these meetings, not me? Sure. Um, 
just that uh, I talked to Matt this week and they, Vail is really committed to make this a successful event for us. So we really appreciate the support. And um, Cheryl Stern has also come back and uh, is doing a lot of work behind the scenes with Anne O'Grady, on Oppenheimer, Beth and others um, to really make this event special this year since we're bringing it back um, after a couple of years of hiatus. But uh, uh, you'll see some uh, emails going out next week. Uh, we're looking for, of course, silent auction donations as well as regular donations like we always ask for. And so um, as we get closer, you'll start seeing more and more being put out. And that's it. Uh, thanks, Rick. All right. Uh, any questions on the summer festival? All right, a lot of progress since the last month. Um, let's I have the just, general manager's report. Or, sorry. I, I would just comment that I'm glad to see it's back on the plaza because up to the community, like to be going together will be great. Yeah. Okay. General manager's report. Um, uh, had a lot of training this week, um, various things, various components coming through um, the office, a lot of water, wastewater, which included uh, staff was involved as well. And so that was, they were all online. We purchased an annual subscription to the AW, um, AWWA learning seminars. Um, we've made good use of it. It's definitely saved us a, a lot of money um, by doing it that way and doing it all remotely. So um, it could help also helps the continuum education units of our operators so that they don't have to attend class, other classes. So that also is a, a help. Um, we are at this time fully staffed and we have two operators in wastewater and two operators in water uh, slash solid waste. So that's great. Um, we've had to pivot this week with a mild COVID issue throughout the ran through the district and um, has caused us to bring water talent back for an additional two weeks to assist us um, but we should be we're hopefully on the downhill slide of that and uh, that's about all i have okay thanks any questions for all right uh, rick operations report yeah just real briefly you know um, it's a transition time where we're you know, buttoning up winter, but really preparing for summer. And as Brandy mentioned earlier, you know, we have dusted off the summer project list. We're constantly adding more and more items to it. And uh, what's new this year is we're getting a numerous amount of USAs, uh, which means I, it's going to be a very busy construction season. So um, other than that, that's about all I have to report. Okay. Uh, any questions for Rick? All right, uh, standing committee reports, um, finance. Yeah, we uh, we met and you know we go through the financials just like we did today, and then we went through the the fiscal year budget draft that we went through today, and also the snow removal allocations. Uh, the other item uh, is on the wastewater treatment plant funding. So you know the next phase is to you know work with CoBank and close on the uh, construction financing or the commercial financing and. I saw correspondence between uh, Eric and Cobank today. Uh, Eric, do you have any other thing you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, we were just waiting on the final estimate from Stantec for the engineering. Um, I am shocked to report that it is less than what we had budgeted for the engineering component. Um, so that was a pleasant surprise. Um, I need to go back and look at our other contract if I add them together, see if it comes in at that number. but. Um, it definitely came in at or below what we had originally estimated on our engineering design. So that's good as 442,000 roughly. So I got that to CoBank and they have everything that, or uh, Bentley should have everything he needs to uh, prep the initial draw. Wow, that's great. Uh, okay, uh, Peter, operations. Uh, the main thing we discussed was the chipper. Uh, besides that, we uh, successfully launched our new our new ATV uh, track machine uh, was taken down to Bear River and it, the guys broke it in and it looks like it's gonna be a, a good investment. Okay, and how about communications? Communications, uh, I, I would like to thank Ann Oppenheimer for the press release that she put together that was published in the Tahoe Tribune on the 10th. 
anybody who wants to view that, you can go online. It was uh, and and read it. A, a very professional job, and I want to thank Ann for all her hard work. And uh, I guess our next issue will be uh, tabulating the, uh, the results of the survey, the customer satisfaction survey. Yeah, are you going to send out a reminder? Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> that was a hint. <laughs> just as a, just, I mean, I don't know, Peter, Eric, could you comment on how many responses we've received to date and how many? I, are... I can't with the uh, key personnel that working on that being out this week, all week. Okay. All good. Thanks. Sorry about that. All good. Uh, okay. Uh, planning. Is there anything else besides your written report? Uh, just gratitude to to Brandy for all the work that she did on the standards. Um, gratitude to the board for approving them, and we look forward to those results because one of the conversations still on the planning committee is the PBC, which will be informed by the survey results just mentioned. So, looking forward to seeing those. Great. Okay. And personnel did not meet. The temporary advisory committee, um, we had our discussion on, on electricity. The only other thing I can report on fire funding is we did get a support letter written by our state state Senator, Brian Dolly. Uh, so we've now sent a request for a million dollars for a fire truck through the budget committee. Um, the May revise comes out on Monday. And after that, they all go in and huddle. So we'll be working the tables to make sure that see if we can get that to stick in the budget so more to come later nice okay uh, yeah it'll be great and the last question is does anyone have any general discussion board members who want to bring up oh oh bob just real quick on the um, emergency fire yeah. funding source i just wanted to update um, i didn't get a chance to to mention it to to john but i did um speak with the special assessment engineer um, and attorney um, and he was able to uh, confirm with DTA, which is the pretty much uh, Dave Tosig Associates, probably the best uh, special tax assessment um, attorney around um, and was able to confirm with him um, that his availability to work on this project. And um, I did get a revised estimate. So I had originally put, I think, 100,000 in and, and they're thinking more in the 80,000 range. So I did update that. Um, uh, you saw Kelly updated it um, in her uh, operational budget, and I have a meeting with them in two weeks to uh, kind of talk about things and, and kick it off and pull together a scope and fee. That's great. Pretty good. Uh, okay. I have one more question. I should have asked for the cheaper. Uh, are we going through that process for a grant to get half of it pay, or is that something that's moving forward? I'm not sure I understand to what you're referring. For the chipper, the wood chipper. Oh, uh, the chipper wasn't part. The wood chipper wasn't part of the grant application. They eliminated that from the grant application. It's just uh, for fifty percent of the labor, and it was okay. submitted. Okay. And maintenance, ma periodic maintenance. C correct. And f I was fuel in there too, Peter. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh, my understanding yeah. is we, we received some written comments from the public. Are those going to be made available to the board? They were sent uh, out they already. Were, they were sent an email. There was, uh, from Kelly. Uh, Kelly sent it to everyone. Yeah. Oh, because I didn't see that. Uh, it was in the email that was sent out yesterday, I believe. Uh, no, sent out this, this morning. Or this I morning. I got sent out this at 1.44 a.m. from Ann Fleur. So yes. sent out this okay. morning. She's, She's in yeah, France this morning. Yeah, 14 hour difference, that'll do it. No, no, nine, nine. Was oh, it only nine? <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah. 14 is Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, those, those were yeah. sent out. I will, um, I can have Kelly resend that to you, Peter, but you should have got that this morning about uh, 8.30. I, I don't think, I don't believe I did, but uh, yeah, if she could she send, send it to the distribution list, so. Uh, I did receive them. You got them, Bertrand? Yep. Okay. Yeah. John, I, did them. I got them. John, okay. how about you? Uh, I'd have to go. I, I think I did. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll just have her resend them, Peter, on Monday. She's gone. Okay. Uh, then, with that, we'll adjourn this meeting. See everybody on June 10th, hopefully in oh, person. Hey, Bob, one thing we should consider yeah. uh, before we adjourn 
Um, yes. Is there general consensus among the board that we should have the board meeting in July on July 1st since summer festivals on July 2nd? Kind of traditional we do that. I, do, I, I ambivalent, but I just thought I'd throw it out because that's been the tradition. Which day of the week is that? Fr Friday. It'd just be oh, one yeah. week early, same time, but it would be the weekend of summer festival, which I know the board generally likes to do, but happy to keep it on July 8th instead. Uh, it's the board's call. If there's consensus to do that, it should let me know now so I just can get it advertised. Uh, I, I think it's a good idea. I, I do the tradition thing. I, I agree. So everybody likes uh, July 1st? Okay, good. We'll get it on the calendar. I, 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 I dump it. I can make it. <laughs> Are you not coming for summer festival, Bob? I, I can't because our friend is getting married. And oh. he's been waiting. he's been waiting two years for COVID to... Yeah. yeah. So I'm not I'm not gonna miss the wedding. Unfortunately. Is that okay? Okay. Then? You will be able to make yeah, it. Yeah, I'll I'll make I'll make it work. Yeah. Yeah, zoom, okay. huh? You can zoom. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks. Have a good Bye, weekend. Everyone.